Hey everyone, it's uh, it's Eric here. I got a uh, special guest with me today, uh, George Widger. Uh, we're going to be discussing the current uh, J Vatican Jesuit crusade that is going on in Ukraine, um, CV19, uh, a whole bunch of other host of topics. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I know it's been a while since we've done a live stream here on the uh, Eric Triple Seven channel. Uh, it's nice to be back. I hope I hope you're all doing well. Um, but to kick off uh, the stream today, I, I think it's uh, a, t a good quote from the U.S. Brigadier General Herbert C. Holdridge. Um, he, he's the only general, United States uh, general uh, that I've seen in the 20th century who is a dissident against the Jesuit Vatican Black International Power Structure. Um, here's a, a letter he wrote, and he, he talks about how this is at the time when Khrushchev was in charge of Russia, and this was at the height of the Cold War um hysteria back in the 60s and we're definitely into a new cold war now let's say like a hot war uh between uh nato um and uh U ukraine uh, or nato and ukraine uh, against russia the war is being fought via proxy in ukraine against russia um but here's the letter that uh, herbert c holdridge wrote and he, he writes about how surely uh khrushchev understands that you can never have total disarmament as long as Jesuit Vatican forces dominate the United States foreign policy. And here, and this was from a, a blueprint or a, actually, it's a, it's a blue, it, Herbert Horge wrote a document called Blueprint for Economic Democracy. This isn't from that. This is from a newsletter he wrote called Reveal on October 28th, 1959. Uh, and you see here in the, the subheading Je Jesuit Vatican Strategy. He says this strategy is is as specific and is fully developed for total war as the strategy of the USSR is, is in the direction for total disarmament and peace. The record of the Vatican over centuries has been of one of continuous violence, of which the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day in France is but one illustration. And George, actually, I'm sure, you, George, you're aware that uh, the day that the FDA um, supposedly approved the, uh, the Pfizer VAXX, for CV-19 uh, was on an anniversary date of the Catholic St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. So that was, would have uh, been August, August uh, Yeah, was, uh, the, the 23rd. 23rd. Uh, well, yes, it took place over the several days, but it started on the 20, the 22nd, 23rd. So um, that, you know, and, something and, we were and, talking and Georgia, about. Georgia, just, just for the historical record, that, that was about 100,000 dead protestants that were massacred at the hands of catholic militants uh, in france yes in paris and various other cities like Lyon, um and of course that has been basically disappeared from the history books i don't what i was going through governmental indoctrination i mean public schools here in the united states <laughs> we never study that now i did study it once um uh, in a college course but that was like uh, a <laughs> Uh, an, an anomaly um so and my degree is in history so the old joke is if you want to make sure you learn nothing about history get a degree and if you want to teach other people to not to learn anything about history get an advanced degree like a master's or, or a phd and i'm only half joking when i say that well, for me, like the only, the only when I, like, when I remember when I was in the, this was, I guess, in high school history class. The only time, that's the only time that Jesuits were ever brought up in the history lessons I got in my schooling. And they were always just passive figures in the background. Like they, ne they never, ever brought in their, their political influence. Uh, they're, you know, their, their military, their influence over, you know, militaries, their influence over the economics, you know, philosophy, sociology, science. You know, the Jesuits are true internationalists. Um, they're in every single field you can imagine. But, you, you know, the, and again, such a, the history of the Jesuits, I'd say, is the history of the world. From well, the yeah, I heard were, the time that they were created. But what this, the, the, what I was taught in high school was such a trivial, you know, brush over of what the Jesuits were. They, oh, you know, the, they, they were accompanying some of the explorers to uh, to Canada. That's basically it. Well, you that, could that's say all that. we were, that's all we were taught. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm not sure who said this, but to be ignorant, somebody said to be ignorant of the Society of Jesus, their official name, is to be ignorant of the last half millennia. Because they basically run everything, as you said, 
the military, law enforcement, intelligence, you know, information gathering, uh, entertainment, uh, i.e. sports, movies, TV shows, uh, the news media, TV, radio, newspapers, every uh, finance, everything. However, before I get into uh, the material I'd like to share. Well, as you, George, just, uh, just I think a, a great quote just to before we go on with Herbert C. Holdridge. Um, this the, the quote people should watch is what E. Howard Hunt said about the Jesuits. And it's the, very interesting. Are, I would, they, I'm just observing this now. You actually have to go onto the search bar. But when you type in E. Howard J Hunt Jesuits on YouTube, nothing comes up. So that <laughs> that's J J Jesu tube uh, censoring that very revealing clip. So, but if people go, I I, I have this covered on my uh, Jesuit World Order blog. But E. Howard Hunt said this on a um, Canadian. It was actually a Canadian documentary in 1998 about uh, the, the CIA 1954 coup d'etat in Guatemala. But this was straight from the horse's mouth, as you'd say. This this is the top CIA covert action official saying the Jesuits form the greatest intelligence service in the world. So here's that quote here. The uh, lines of authority, within, I wouldn't presume to trace the uh, lines of authority within the Catholic Church, how they get their information, but they do. And, We've always said, you know, in an admiring way, that the the Jesuits uh, formed the greatest intelligence service in the world. Always had. Did you catch that there, George? The Jesuits formed the greatest intelligence service in the world, and always have. That's uh, okay. It's E. Howard Hunt uh, saying that. <laughs> well, uh, well see, official. Well, well, see, one of the problems is that was aired in Canada. And probably very few people south of the border have ever seen that. Um, and if people have not watched the documentary, I would suggest they do so. But how many people even in Canada watch this documentary? Probably oh, no, barely any. Like the doc, it got buried. The documentary got buried. I, I'm amazed yeah. I was able to like it, it was on. It was available on the internet in like little chunks of like five to six minute blocks, and I was able to merge all of them together into like a full. It's not quite. I think I have like a minute or two missing from the very beginning, um, and that that documentary is on my YouTube channel. I'll link it in the video description box after uh, the stream's concluded here today. Um, but yeah, absolutely, everyone should watch that uh, documentary. It's called. Okay. It, the, the title of it is called "A Coup Made in America." Uh, on the topic of the Guatemala CIA coup d'état in 1954. It actually, right before Hunt makes that admission about the Jesuits there, George, he says that Cardinal Spellman gave the CIA orders on uh, constructing uh, the coup. Uh, he, he literally uh, says that we, he says we got the, the quote from E. Howard Hunt is he says, we got the okay from Cardinal Spellman to go ahead with this. Ah, uh, so. Um, uh, this is very revealing. Uh, but George, I just want to keep going here with uh, what Herbert C. Holdridge said. So, so after he writes about the Vatican being involved uh, with the violence at the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France, <clears throat> the U.S. Brigadier General says, the Jesuits know that they must maintain the status quo of exploitation or perish. They too have read the prophecies which predict that the Vatican will be destroyed in one quick moment, uh, quote, as a stone cast into, uh, into the sea. And Holdridge writes, they fight as cornered animals. Uh, and he continues, Pope Pius XII put Hitler into power, Roman Catholic, Austrian Adolf Hitler, and approved his destruction of Roman Catholic France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. Uh, and many of these countries are collapsing now uh, due to the insane uh, crusade uh, into the Ukraine, um, where they're just essentially with they're just destroyed with energy prices in Germany or up. What, over 50 percent um you know but many europeans are going hungry um their economies are collapsing um all for this crusade uh but we continue here um the post a war incitement for an a bomb quote the hit russia now doctrine was clearly hatched in the vatican and promoted by the u.s press and public officials the policy was publicized by jesuit father edmund walsh head of the department of diplomacy of georgetown university George, actually, I'm holding a pamphlet here that Holdridge wrote in 1954 titled Classification of the Hierarchy of the Vatican and its Agents in the United States of Subversives. And he, Holdridge on the back 
uh, quotes Father Edmund Walsh, S.J., probably the most powerful Jesuit in America of the 20th century. That's who the School of Foreign Service is named after at Jesuit Georgetown University, the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Edmund Walsh, in his book, um, Total Empire, writes, quote, Would the United States be justified in launching an immediate atomic attack against an enemy power before it could use that devastating weapon against our cities? And he gives the answer on page 255. And the Jesuit writes, Edmund Walsh, quote, in my opinion, consequently, use of the atomic bomb against an aggressor named uh, as an aggressor by the United Nations. <laughs> so, so if the United Nations labels a country an aggressor, uh, even though the, the invasion may not be immediately directed against the United States, uh, would not violate Christian morality. And that is, it would not violate Christian morality to launch an atomic bomb against Russia, for example. Um, and there are good people going to, they, you know, there's a debate online in the truth community. I think there's lots of evidence uh, to question the existence of atomic bombs, especially when you know the history of that the Jesuits somehow survived the Hiroshima explosion. Um, but, you know, that that was over, you know, that, well, that was, Eric, seven, that was 70 years ago. I'm sure in that span of time, uh, there's been new advancements in weapon technologies and engineering. I'm sure they have. If not, if they're not specific atomic bombs, I'm sure they have bombs that would cause similar okay. types of destruction. Well, you see, the uh, Jesuits not only survived one explosion, but two: Hiroshima on August the sixth, and Nagasaki a few days later. And they said, "Oh, it was a, a miracle, the Rosary." Absolutely, they credited the Rosary to it. Absolutely, and I, I, I can uh, I can bring up some links. Uh, I have some propaganda pamphlets written from the Jesuits themselves uh, where they, they credit the rosary for saving them in Nagasaki. Um, but it's very interesting how like the Ed, Father Edmund Walsh at Jesuit Georgetown University, the most powerful Jesuit in America in the 20th century, says that uh, uh, if the United Nations deems a country an aggressor, that you can justifiably launch an atomic bomb against that country and not violate Christian morality. Um, well, here's, here's a, fa a factoid. Uh, people probably, some people probably know about Paul Tibbetts, the pilot of the Enola Gay, that was supposed to have dropped something on Hiroshima. What it was is a matter of debate. Now, Tibbetts was a Roman Catholic. However, his co pilot, uh, Robert Lewis, converted to Catholicism in the 1950s. As a matter of fact, he spoke, Lewis spoke at Georgetown University in 1954. About really his conversion. On the, wow. Well, I know George. One of one of and one of the men that uh, so, one, of the, um, one of the pilots that uh, was involved with the firebombing of Nagasaki. Or no, yeah, I think it was Nagasaki. Um, prior to the A bomb drop, uh, Thomas Power, Brigadier General Thomas Power, he later became the head of the U.S. Strategic Air Command, but he was knighted as a Knight of Saint Sylvester. Uh, a year after the Kennedy assassination, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I, I just want to continue here with uh, Herbert D. Holdridge. Uh, he, he writes, Pius XII promoted the massacres of Roman Catholics in Hungary, aided and abetted by Alan Dulles of the CIA and Roman Catholic General Grunther. And if people aren't aware, Alan Dulles of the CIA and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, like John Foster Dulles's son became a Jesuit priest. Avery Dulles, S.J. He's Alan Dulles's nephew, which is very significant when you know that Alan Dulles was one of the main uh, individuals in the United States government during the time of World War II, for instance, who smuggled thousands of Nazis, who was involved in the smuggling of thousands of Nazis uh, across Europe through the Roman Catholic Church's network of uh, buildings and orphanages. And like many Nazis were disguised as Jesuits and Catholic priests, like uh, Borman, for instance, was disguised as a Jesuit priest when he was shipped out to Argentina. Uh, but so and this is known as the Vatican Rat Lines. But Alan Dulles was very involved with that, and then his nephew becomes a Jesuit priest, probably one of the most prominent Jesuit priests in America, Avery Dulles. Uh, but uh, Holbridge writes here to so Pius promoted the massacres of Roman Catholic. Hung Roman Catholics in Hungary to restore Hungarian lands to the church and to the big landowners. Exactly what has happened in medieval France. And I would say what's happening now across the Western world. So COVID-19 
COVID-19 lockdowns led to the biggest upward transfer of wealth in human history. Uh, Pope John Paul XXIII has enunciated much of the same policy, giving moral support in advance to an H-bomb war to protect the Jesuit interest in Berlin. Senator Kennedy, and this was written when uh, Kennedy was a candidate for office. Senator Kennedy, so Holdridge was very concerned, I guess, at this time that John F. Kennedy, being a Roman Catholic, was a puppet of the Vatican. Kennedy ended up resisting the Vatican, and that's why he was murdered. Uh, but that's a whole other topic. Senator Kennedy, favorite son of the Holy Father, declares his candidacy for president of the United States on this openly announced platform of international murder. And here he writes, Governor Brown of California. That's a reference to Governor Jesuit uh, Jerry Brown. Another favorite son of the Holy Father runs interference in hopes that he too may be called uh, for president. And he writes, Slippery Dick Nixon, married to a Roman Catholic, who has openly conspired with the Vatican hierarchy in Latin America and whose finger is un undoubtedly in the current Cuban pie is equally dangerous in the Republican party. These subversives are truly demented if they believe that the non-Jesuits of the United States will hold still while they overthrow our constitutional freedoms by placing a Roman Catholic into office as president to bring the Pope into the White House by the back door. George, speaking on that note, have you seen the photos of uh, Joe Biden's desk in the Oval Office where he has that big photo of Pope Francis on his desk, Jesuit Pope Francis? Well, I, I have not. However, I know that he had an audience, uh, Biden, as president, had an audience with Francis last, was it 2022 or, or was it 2021? And it's interesting. Yeah, he did have an audience um, with him, yeah. So it's interesting. He, also had, he also had an audience with him while being vice president. And of course, Francis visited the u.s congress and addressed a live session of congress while biden was vice president and biden could be seen like tearing up in the background when the pope was same thing with congress. The, well um uh, same thing with the then speaker john boner both of whom uh boner so you have the hegelian dialectic you had uh joe biden uh, i'm talking about when francis addressed the, US, the joint section of congress back in september of 2015 was it the 25th Okay, so you had Joe Biden, who was president of the time, and um, you had John Boner, who was a Speaker of the House. Now, Boner was supposed to be a conservative Republican, and uh, Biden was supposed to be a leftist Democrat. But they're both uh, cheering up. And as I said, Boner is a Knight of Columbus, devout Roman Catholic. He went to Xavier University. Um, so, they control, so they control both sides the so-called conservatives and the so-called liberals. And it, it, so that is how they get their agenda. So in the United States, and I'm sure this is true in most other countries, we have two major political parties. We have the communist socialists and we have a controlled opposition. That, that's it. Um, the Republicans, you know, they talk a bunch of smack and they say a number of things that are correct, you know, just like on Fox News or whatever. However, they don't do anything. Uh, the new Speaker of the House here in the United States is well, Kevin McCarthy. George, it, was, it was a Republican president that officially had like, uh, had the United States government recognize uh, the Holy See as a sovereign entity, uh, Ronald Reagan, 1984, and then got into official diplomatic relations with the Holy See. So now there's an American ambassador stationed in the Vatican, and there's a Vatican nuncio or apostolic delegate stationed in Washington, D.C. And Ronald Reagan so, made that. Uh, here's a little fact. Of course, it, okay, so that before, happened before Ronald years. Reagan, George, I'm sure you're aware that U.S. presidents would have an unofficial ambassador to the Vatican. Like they would say President yeah, Roosevelt during him. World War II was uh, Myron Taylor, Knight of Malta, uh, CEO of U.S. Steel. Um but Reagan made it official. That was a Republican president who did that. Of course, and the Republicans yeah, were in charge during 9-11. <laughs> you know, the 9-11 false okay, well, attack. Okay, so here's a factoid. You mentioned that Reagan officially reestablished diplomatic relations with the Vatican uh, in 1984 on January the 10th, so 39 years ago. Well, as it just so happens, exactly 33 years later, on the 10th of January 2017, Antony Fauci when he was at Georgetown University, said that there would be a surprise outbreak during the Trump administration. So this happened exactly 33 years ago. 
So I was just wondering, what did Fallacy know that nobody else knew? Well, he, he had the long-term, like, he, he's a Jesuit insider. He was given the Jesuits Ad Morgium Del Gloria Award by the USA oh. Northeast Province in 2021. Uh, so he he was he he was given the long term plans uh, to usher in uh, a pandemic to completely reorganize society uh, in their new feudalistic, digitized, uh, globalized uh, world. Well, you know, he when he retired at the end of last year, his salary was something like four hundred eighty thousand dollars, almost half a million bucks, which made him the highest paid bureaucrat in the U.S. Now he he only gets about three fourths of that. So you're talking like hundred sixty thousand dollars, but that's not including all the hundreds of millions of dollars he's probably worth. Because among other things, he was on the board of directors for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So he has all sort. Of course, he's going to say these interventions are safe and effective. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, as uh, Nick has shown on the Jesuit World Order, is, is essentially a Jesuit missionary congregation. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think you know this uh, already. Melinda Gates Gates herself like, is a Jesuit test, and Bill Gates is a, you know, a Jesuit coadjutor. Millions well, of dollars. Of he donates millions and millions to Jesuit universities. Well, and of course, Melinda said that. Um, this is when she was still married to Bill. That she has said her great uncle was a Jesuit and her great aunt was a Dominican nun. As a matter of fact, her great aunt is the one who taught her how to read. So it's just the. Uh, <laughs> and I know that well, reminds you part, of part of our schooling at the part of our schooling at the Ursuline, uh, the all nuns school in Dallas or in Texas where she grew up. But she writes about it in her book how she would actually also go to the Jesuit Dallas prep school for courses when she was young. Ah, she's been, she's okay. been molded by Jesuit minds her, her whole life, and she's she's had ah, numerous okay. visits to the Vatican to meet with Pope Francis. <laughs> there. Um, but George, I just want to finish up here with the Holdridge note. Um, uh, he, he writes here just uh, Pius XII engineered the massacres in Guatemala and Buenos Aires a few years, a few years ago. Uh, John XXIII follows the same strategy in Cuba today. This is, I think, a very timely line here because I think the U.S. has never been closer to a third world war than they are now. If an H-bomb war is ever launched, but it will not be an accident by some overwrought pilot of an H-bomb plane flying beyond his assigned mission, but by a homicidal Roman Catholic maniac in the White House. Uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> he, he's the homicidal Roman Catholic maniac in the White House, the State Department, or the Pentagon. Who's in charge of the Pentagon right now, George? You got Roman Catholic Lloyd Austin, former Ra former Raytheon board member, the head of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Mark Milley, a Roman Catholic, former altar boy, <clears throat> and then Anthony Blinken at the State Department. I know he's openly uh, or nominally Jewish, but he his wife he married his wife in uh, the, jo the Jesuit Church in Washington D.C. that Joe Biden goes to. Uh, yeah, his wife here, Evan Ryan, she's serving as White House Cabinet Secretary in the administration of Joe Biden. She's the former Assistant Secretary for Educational Cultural Affairs in the Obama administration. Anthony Blinken's wife went to Jesuit Boston College. Uh, and same John, thing and, with... Uh, uh, John Hopkins, where Event 201 was. <laughs> right before okay, that. and of course... And of course, you know, we've talked at great lengths about uh, Anthony Fauci, Anthony Stephen Fauci, but we really haven't talked about Tony's wife. Fauci's wife, Christine Grady. Oh, your uh, your voice went out there a bit, George. Triple dip. She got her undergrad and PhD from Boston College, and she got her master's from Georgetown. So between Tony and Chris, they have about 20 years of Jesuit education. So for all intents and purposes, he's a priest and she's a nun. 
Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Georgia. You just you, you came back in after you said yes. Yeah, she, you're saying she has she has three Jesuit degrees. I know she went to Georgetown and Boston College, and she, along with Jesuit Tony Fauci, received the Ad Majorium de Glorium Award. Yeah, uh, so, in 2021. It was a joint. It was Fauci and Christine Grady that received the award. Yes. So uh, I've seen your clip of that, and we've discussed that on the previous video. So, for all intents and purposes. He's a priest and she's a nun. Oh, absolutely. And 100%. You know, they're, they're absolute. Uh, Fauci is a, 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 I would say he's an ordained Jesuit priest. And that's why I refer to him like with SJ in his name. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, I know we saw too, George, the Jesuit College of the Holy Cross renamed their medical school, the, the Anthony, or their science school, the Anthony S. Fauci uh, Science Academy or something along those lines. Well, if I can just mention another piece of trivia, but there's a video of him at least 10 years ago, maybe like 20 years ago, where uh, somebody was doing like a fluff piece like the Life and Times of Anthony Fausti. And uh, one of the things that came up was his Jesuit education at Regis High School in Manhattan, New York. And he said he lived something like an hour and a half away. So that meant he had to take the train and a bus. So he had to spend three hours a day just going to and from school. That's 13 hours a week. That's dedication. And he had to do that for four years. So uh, I'd imagine he, he uses downtime to go, you know, he did homework or, or whatever. But well, I've, most, Fauci, I, I haven't done the research into it, but I'm sure he, I'm sure his family, I'm sure he has tons of Jesuit Vatican connections with his family. Well, like older I, family members. Well, I know that his mother-in-law, um, Christine's mom, was like the dean or assistant dean for missions at Seton Hall. Now, that's Catholic, but not specifically Jesuit. So that goes way back. So if, if I can just park on that just for a second. So Tony spent, as a teenager, spent 15 hours a day. I'm sorry, uh, three hours a day, 15 hours a week. Just going to and from school. We're not talking about a job. We're talking about school. So I think the Jesuits said there, hey, Tony, if you stick with us, we'll guarantee you success in whatever it is you do. Well, it's definitely it's, it worked out for him. Great. He had a 38-year reign as the uh, director of the NIAID. Yeah, so I, I like to, and I always hear it all the time. People are like, how 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 does this guy stay in government for thirty eight years? Like it's right in plain sight. He's a Jesuit, and the well, Jesuits I, I run do. the show. So the fact that the Jesuits run the show and Fauci's being a Jesuit is why he's completely untouchable. It's why he didn't go to jail for lying to the Congress. Same reason mm -hmm. that Roman Catholic James Clapper of the NSA didn't go to jail when he perjured himself at the U.S. Congress when he lied and said that the NSA isn't doing mass surveillance on American citizens. Well, you know, so he became the director, the head of the National Infectious Disease, or whatever it is, uh, in 1984, as you said. However, uh, well, that was under the auspices of the National Institutes of Health, the NHS. Now, fallacy has been there since 1968. So he was with the federal government for over half a century, 54, yeah, 54 years. So in other words, he was like the J. Her he was like the four years because I know in uh, I just I know in um, Gematria I believe Jesuit equals fifty four. Ah, that's why like the Jes like the Joseph Jesuit Joseph Rettinger um, created uh, <coughs> the Bilderberg Group on in nineteen fifty four. Ah, so but that's so, a, so you're saying Fauci is in the government fifty four years. I'm saying that would be uh, significant. So he basically was like the medical Jagger Hoover. Yeah, Jesuit order is 54. Yeah. Well, no, that's a good way to look at him, is the medical Jagger Hoover. Of course, so, Jagger Hoover received the um, a replica of Ignatius Loyola's sword in uh, 1964, the sword of Loyola, for mm -hmm. his role in covering up the Kennedy assassination. It was like a year to the date after the Kennedy assassination. Hoover gets. The Sword of Loyola. I think it was two years after the one-year anniversary at Loyola, Chicago. And uh, you know, I know you found that Hoover got like like ten Jesuit honorary degrees. Oh well, he years. got well. He got at least fifteen 
Catholic degrees. Uh, this is according, and now you turn me on to Steve Vernbross's 2009 book, uh, The FBI and the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, on the front cover, uh, Hoover is getting uh, an honorary degree from Notre Dame in 42 or 43. And one of the things that Vernbross mentions is that um, Hoover got at least 15 different honorary degrees from various Catholic institutions, like Georgetown, like Notre Dame. Um, and so... I've yeah, seen, to... George, uh, if you see my screen here, that I've uploaded that book actually onto archive.org. So people can read oh. that for free here. Here's the book like, that George is referencing, the FBI and the Catholic Church, 1935 to 1962. This is a very, wow. very good book, uh, especially the whole first chapter goes like you see how the, the, the Jesuits completely control the FBI just by reading mm -hmm. the, the first chapter in this book. Just like um, you know, what do you call the CIA, the Catholics in Action, Catholic Invisible Army, uh, Catholic Intelligence Agency, uh, Cocaine Importation Agency. What do they call the FBI? Was it the Fascist Bureau of Inquisition? Yep, Fascist Bureau of Inquisition. So it's just like... Um, when you think about it, George, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that warrants the creation of an FBI. It just so mm -hmm. happened that the first uh, director at that time it was called the Bureau of Investigation, uh, but the first director just happened to be uh, a descendant of Napoleon, Charles mm -hmm. Joseph Bonaparte, and the Charles Joseph Bonaparte was a devout, devout Roman Catholic. Uh, I believe a Knight of Malta, good friends with the uh, Archbishop in Baltimore at the time, Archbishop Gibbons. Um, Charles Joseph Bonaparte viewed non-Catholics as heretics. Well, at least he was being and honest. Actually, and I have that documented on my website from a Catholic biography that was written on him from a Catholic priest. And this, so that that's that should that should tell you everything that you know, like uh, you know that that explains why why has there never been an FBI federal uh, investigation into the uh, sex abuse crimes of the Catholic clergy all across the United States? That's interstate crime. Well, you know, um, they, okay, they're, uh, now I'm just wondering, uh, do you, so I presume you, you get American TV shows in Canada? Oh, yeah, yeah, most of Canadian culture, it's all American. Okay, so there's been a, um, back in the 1960s, from 1964 to 75, there was a TV show called FBI, I was Epo Zibbles Jr., and I don't think I ever watched it because it just was, this wasn't my thing. But they did a, a reboot a few, few years ago called The New FBI, and they have some spinoffs. Well, the so in this new iteration of FBI, uh, they also have like an international version and a man and a, like a, a manhunt version or most wanted. Um, the FBI, they're always the good guys. They're thwarting the they're thwarting the evil villains who are trying to attack America and things like that. And so it's just complete mind control. Now, there may be some street-level agents who are not read in, who are trying to actually fight crime, but the people who run the FBI are completely Luciferian. And it's not just the FBI. It's the CIA, the, uh, the NAS, law enforcement. And if I can just give you... Uh, are you still doing the Holbridge quote? Oh, actually, yeah, actually, we got... Uh, yeah, we got, we got it up right here, yeah. I still got, there's a couple more lines I want to, just to go in that. Okay, so can I just, before you, you go on with that, as you know, last month there were a number of uh, bang bang incidents, I'll just call them that, in the West Coast. Three in California and one in Washington State, specifically Yakima. And of course, the Emperor of California, Gavin Newsom, came out and said, oh, guns are too prevalent. You know, we need to crack down on, we need to have stricter laws, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we can't, you know, Enough with this, you know, prayers and thoughts. You know, we need definitive action. So, one of the episodes, as I said, took place in Yakima, Washington, which is has about a hundred thousand people, and that's where our, our buddy uh, Zach Hubbard used to live there. So, it's not a major metropolis. However, I guess on the twenty fourth of last month, somebody walked into a convenience store uh, at three thirty in the morning Pacific and shot four people and killed three, I believe, and. I, I'm a bit fuzzy on the details because they keep changing them. Um, anyhow, the chief of police in Yakima, Washington, which has about 100,000 people, is Matt Murray. And he got his undergrad degree from Regis University in Aurora, Colorado, just outside of Denver, which is a Jesuit school. 
So, as I said, you're not talking about Seattle. You're not talking about Spokane. You're talking about Yakima. So why is it they have a Jesuitly trained t- uh, top cop in this relatively small town? Well, the Jesuits got uh, Gonzaga University there in Washington State. Well, well, they have uh, two. They have the aforementioned Gonzaga in Spokane, which is on the eastern side of the state. <clears throat> and you have the secular-sounding uh, Seattle University in, uh, well, Seattle. So, Actually, and, and that would include both prep school. There would be like a Gonzaga prep and a Seattle okay. prep. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for those. putting that up. So, and, and I'm sure I, that, and I, there's probably, like, I'm sure, like, uh, I'm not aware of the whole network of Jesuit schools in Washington State. I'm sure they have high schools there, too, and various well, other prep schools. Well, yes. So, anyhow, so you talk, you had this event, and there was, like, a big manhunt. And, um, you know, as I said, this took place on January 24th. So, since Zach lives relatively close there, maybe less than an hour away. He just had to go do some uh, <laughs> stooping around. And as it just so happens... The Masonic Lodge in Yakima, Washington, is known as Number Twenty Four, and as I said, uh, the killer—I forgot his name—Maddock um, or Attic or something—not Stephen Paddock. Uh, what uh, fled? I guess on Highway Twenty Four. I, I won't get into the, to the numbers. So, as I said, the chief of police there was trained with the Jesuits. You had this incident hmm, that seemed very curious. Now, you also had some other events that just taken place over the previous few days. You uh, had a shooting in Monterey Park, California, which is just outside of L.A. You had one in Half Moon Bay, which is just south of San Francisco. And you had another shooting in Oakland, which is just east, east of San Francisco. And they all seem odd. Um, so the shooting that took place in Monterey Park was the weekend of the Chinese Lunar New Year. And the sheriff of L.A. County is Robert Luna. Now, I don't know his religious affiliation, but Luna means a moon in Spanish. This seems odd. And then a day or two later, you had a shooting in Half Moon Bay. So I well, think... It definitely thing- seems like a coordinated attempt. Uh, and Biden and has been very open like for he wants to introduce gun reform legislation. Jesuit Joe Biden. <laughs> so I, I do admit the, Jesuit- the Roman, Roman Catholic Church is, you know, it's in the Catholic Catechism where they say governments have a duty to regulate firearm sales. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that they have to, have, the pretense in getting rid of the Second Amendment is you have to have all these, you know, shootings and massacres taking place. Uh, so that, yeah. that gets people in the, the emotional state of mind saying, you know, we have to do something to stop this. Well, well yes. And of course, you know, whatever judge is in charge, they're like black cats. Bad thing happened. Uh, for example, uh, Tim Kaine was the governor of uh, Virginia back in, was it April the 16th, uh, uh, 2007, during the Virginia Tech Massacre, in which something like 33 people died. Uh, yes, I said 33. And Tim Kaine, <laughs> uh, I guess, I believe um, Hillary Clinton said, Tim is a Jesuit. Now, I think she may have been facetious. You know, he went to Rockhurst High School in Kansas City, Missouri, and he did a, some time in Central America, I believe, Honduras with the Jesuit volunteers. Yeah, I, I have argued, comments of him on my YouTube channel uh, talking about his time with the Jesuits. Oh, okay. So she actually called him a Jesuit. Hmm. Okay, maybe there's a slip of the tongue on her part. So, oh, definitely anyhow, a slip of the tongue. Okay, so it's funny. I mean, okay, the, so you have this episode that just happened a couple of weeks ago in Yakima, Washington. You had this shooting back in 2007 in Virginia. You know, you had Oklahoma City. Uh, was it Frank Keating went to Georgetown, the governor of Oklahoma. Uh, you had Dan Malloy, the governor of Connecticut, when, oh, something happened there back in 2012 or on December 14th. I forgot what it was. Uh, it was a bang bang incident. So Malone, uh, Malone got his undergrad in law degrees from Boston College. So as it just so happens, <laughs> you've had these places where you, you've had people in power who are trained by the Jesuits. I realize that's just a coincidence. Yeah, I know Sandy Hook was the same situation. Uh, 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 
I, I'm sorry, I, I've never heard of that place. Um, uh, uh, who was the Connecticut governor at the time? Uh, Malloy. D yeah, Dan Malloy. Yeah, yeah, he was at Boston College? Yes, uh, undergrad and law degree, so he was double dip. Double dip, yeah. And they had Boston College Law and Boston College. <laughs> No, it's very interesting how it's very interesting how that works out. <clears throat> Definitely not a coincidence. And no. uh, and like we and we've we we've, you know we've talked in the past about how it's just, it's just kind of worked out where all of the like all of the um, states and municipalities that enacted sanctuary state policies just happen to have Jesuit leadership in charge, Jesuit educated leadership. And of course, well, this is the plan to have like a mass invasion of. Roman Catholic immigrants come across the southern border to change the demographic makeup of the United States to turn the United States into a Catholic majority country, mm -hmm. which is the way that the trend is going long term. <laughs> well, over in Europe is a slightly different situation. They're not using Hispanics from, say, Latin America. They're using people from Africa and the Middle East, and they're, um, and they, and they're doing this to say, well, historically Protestant countries like Germany, your Sweden, Norway. But they're also doing this to ca historically Catholic countries like France, like Italy, like the Irish Republic. Yes, the Irish Republic. Um, and I guess uh, you know, this may be hard for people to grasp, but um, it's just like if you look at the demographics of France, which has a population of about 70 million people, I could go look it up. Only about 5% of the people profess to be some form of Muslim. Uh, whether that's probably mostly Sunni, but only two or maybe three percent profess to be any form of Protestant. So in other words, there are twice as many Muslims in France as there are, say, professed Protestants. Now, the two dominant faiths in France are Catholicism and atheism. Now, I realize we're not supposed to really be talking about religion or demographic here, but well, George, eventually on the stream, I want to get into some comments about how this crusade in Ukraine is a is a Vatican plot to weaken the Orthodox Church. Okay, uh, please, uh, please. Which historically, uh, going back to the schism of uh, 1054, uh, Orthodox Church is one of the biggest spiritual competitors to the Roman Catholic Church, and there, we're going to we'll be bringing up this article here from this Orthodox proto deacon who had who's he, here's the headline from this article from. Website Bitter Winter. It looks like it's a Italian uh, author. It says Russian Orthodox leader Ukraine is a Catholic conspiracy. The Pope is a monster and a thief. Oh, so they, I would say like so that the, with, with the um, Islamic immigration wave into France, I'd say that's being done. It, well, what's what's happening as a result of that is it's weakening the. Uh, Protestant uh, culture in France, or Protestant culture is being phased out. The historic Huguenot uh, culture. Well, that happened hundreds of years ago. Well, you know, that actually happened hundreds of years ago with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. I believe that was also known as the Edict of Flamo. You're talking what, 15? No, I'm sorry. You're talking 1685, thereabouts. You know, we've talked about uh, the Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Um, so with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which was uh, implemented in 1610, I believe, um, which granted religious toleration in all of France. So um, with that revocation, that means all non-Catholics all non had to convert to Catholicism or leave the country. And they were given a certain period of time, like a few months. And so that meant Hundreds of thousands of Huguenots were killed or in a similar number of left. So they went to England, they went to North America, they went to Southern Africa, into what is now South Africa, places like that. Um, so something most people don't realize, and I actually heard this from a secular professor or instructor. He said, after the replication of the Edict of Nantes, uh, France um, went into an economic depression which lasted about a century until the French Revolution. Because even though the Huguenots only comprised maybe 10% of the population, they generated almost all the wealth in France because they were the entrepreneurs, they were the artisans, they were the craftsmen. They basically did things. So in, in terms of, say, the, the non, in terms of the French um, at that time, you had the nobility and you had the clergy. 
it would comprise like maybe one percent of the population, if that. And you had you had some noblemen, just like uh, in England, but the vast majority of the French were peasants. They were landless, illiterate uh, paupers. The exception being the Is it just just the way the church likes it, Catholic church. Ah, well, I really. <laughs> I know this is a bit of a, a running cliche for me. I, I realize that that's just a, uh, a running, uh, that's just a coincidence. So we're basically turning back into pre-Reformation Europe right now in, well, Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, just like, um, well, anyhow, so could you... Uh, well, Georgia, I, so, I think part of this kind of new crusade against the Orthodox Church is that I, I think the Protestant enemy has been conquered at this point. Yes. Effectively. Like, well, there's no, there's absolutely no Protestant resistance uh, to the Roman Catholic Empire. And I think the, the only mm -hmm. resistance coming to is from the like the Russian Orthodox Church. And, uh, and like, I think Putin... And I, I do think, like, the Orthodox traditional society that putin has set up in russia is a direct threat uh, or a direct challenge to the kind of jesuit liberal secular international order that is being promoted in the west where you see the promotion of you know the lgbt mafia the uh transgenderism um the destruction of the the core nuclear family well, uh, you know, the, the, uh, that's still that's still present in the traditionalist Orthodox culture. I think that's another reason why we're seeing this crusade. Ultimately, I, I think that the Vatican wants to go back to the times uh, where there's one universal bishop, being well, the, the, the Pope. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the Pope, uh, according he is infallible. You know, he's been declared as like a as a god and a ruler of the whole world going back to the bull unum sanctum in 1302 it's, it's said that every human subject must be a subject to the pontiff of rome um so that that's why i think we're seeing this uh because you know, we're gonna be I'll, I'll go into this in the in a bit here but Zelensky has announced a crackdown against the russian orthodox church and after the uh the cia vatican coup in 2014 there was a schism within the ukrainian orthodox church and a new breakaway church was created called the orthodox church of ukraine which is what the vatican is using to eventually merge the orthodox church in ukraine into the ukrainian uh, greek orthodox church which is in communion uh with the vatican or the ukrainian greek catholic church the ugcc well, yeah, uh, you know, and that's what uh, that's what this bishop here for, uh, says here, Vladimir Vasilik. But here's a very interesting photo here, George, uh, from 2015, the 2018, where you have one of the have the leader of this new Ukrainian CIA Vatican uh, breakaway church uh, giving a CIA agent here <laughs> um, an award. Here you see here, Kostanopol Hierarch Filar Desenko, head of the schismatic K Kiev Patriarch, has shown his appreciation to another American government figure uh, for his support of Ukraine's national ecclesiastical project. <laughs> so the ecclesiastical well, okay. project is, step, is they want to break away the Orthodox Church in Ukraine from Russian influence. And of course, this CIA agent I found here that's being <laughs> rewarded by the leader of this new Ukrainian schismatic church went to Roman Catholic Villanova University, CIA agent oh. uh, Jack Devine. Okay. He's the former acting director and associate director of the CIA. Okay, so there's a movie that came out. Uh, it was a Jack Ryan film, but I believe Chris Pine was playing the part. I forgot what it was called. It came out the last decade or so. Where um, I know you've talked about Jack Ryan before. And in this film, uh, the bad guys are the Russians. Uh, the one of the leaders. Oh, is that is, is that the plot where they try to uh, hack into Wall Street, George? The Russians. Try I to think hack. so. One of the, the, the uh, Russian bad guys is played by Kenneth Brana, and there's a scene where Brana is in a Russian Orthodox church, I guess, in Moscow, and he's talking to his fellow bad guys, and they say, you know, we need to. I'm paraphrasing. We basically need to restore Mother Russia back to her glory days. And, uh, you know, we've been beaten down for decades, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Jack Ryan has to go over there to thwart this plot. 
So part of the film, I believe, maybe I'm complaining this, but as I said, for the last decade or so, maybe long, the how many movies have come out where the Russians are the bad guys, where they're they're trying to uh, pull off these terrorist acts in the United States? Oh, too many to like, oh, numerous. Like one I could think of right at the top was the popular video game Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in the, I know the 2019 installment, they depict the Russians as ex- executing innocent civilians, like in the in the streets and firing squads. And you're actually like the good guys in the game. Like you're part of like a kind of like an Al Qaeda separatist cell uh, in like a Syrian type of country. I think it's like a, it's an it's an invented uh, Islamic country. But you're trying to rebel against like the Assad figure who's backed by the Russians. <laughs> Which is what happened, or how the Syria dynamic played out from uh, 2012 to 2017. You had the CIA trying to overthrow the government in Syria, and the Russians came in to stop uh, the Vatican operation from occurring. But in that game, though, they really they they really hammer that the Russians are like Nazis. Mm-hmm. Well, you know. Called, but you also have in Russia you have the Southern Wagner Group after named after the German composer uh, Richard Wagner. So <clears throat> the Wagner the Wagner Group they're supposed to be Nazis and the Azov Battalion they're supposed to be Nazis. So it's really hard <laughs> to figure out what's actually going on over there. You know, and well, I, believe, I, th- I think the clear I think what uh, I think the long term goal of this like I think it's an attempt to get just like how the Nazis launched the, the Crusade. In Soviet Russia, uh, in World War II, Operation Barbarossa, named after the Roman Emperor Barbarossa, who the, Bar- the Emperor Barbarossa, the Roman Emperor, launched a crusade uh, into the mid- Middle East back in his time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a thousand years ago at this point. But that uh, I think, and Putin, I think, acknowledged this much uh, as so when he spoke at a recent memorial at the Battle of Stalingrad, where he said once again. Russia faces the threat of German tanks with crosses painted on them. And of course, the Nazi cross was like the, the, that was the Teutonic cross, or like the symbol of uh, bringing back Germany to the Holy Germanic Roman Empire of the times of Charlemagne. That's what the opening <clears throat> of the Third Reich was. And I think this is at the. I think this was all a plot too at the time. A lot of people forget that in 1917. You had that hoax in Portugal where the, supposedly these, and this is the Vatican has turned this hoax into a billion dollar racket where tourists come every year and pay tons of money on merchandise and souvenirs and et cetera. But the, the vision of Mary, I think it was in, in Portugal in 1917, or the vision of Fatima, uh, vision of Fatima, Portugal, I believe it was 19, it was actually right. It, it kind of coincided with the Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah, on May thirteenth, nineteen seventeen, um, it was called the Miracle of Fatima. And supposedly, one of the tenets that the Virgin Mary told this nun was that Russia was to become a Catholic country. Back in nineteen seventeen, and of course, the, and this is why the Vatican welcomed the Bolshevik Revolution initially in nineteen seventeen because the Bolsheviks went after the Russian Orthodox Church nationalized all their properties, confiscated all their assets. Um, and then they, they gave the Vatican preferential treatment. Uh, so I think, I, think, I think Pope Francis is playing a delicate game, and that's why I think he's made those comments. I'm, I'm sure you're aware he made those comments um, where he said NATO is barking at the gates of Russia, referring to this conflict in Ukraine. So I think because he, I think cause he Pope Francis knows that Russia is going to win this. Uh, the only way that they don't is if you have u.s troops get involved polish troops romanian troops and that that's a third world war which could be in the end of the world so like francis is realizing that the proxy war in ukraine is going to be a failure so he's making these public statements to inevitably kind of open back up that diplomatic channel with putin and russia once they eventually win that's kind of how i see it and the, you had recently uh, the, the the cia director uh william burns make comments at Georgetown University two days ago saying how like, the next six months are critical 
uh, in Ukraine. Because um, I, I think within the next six months, I think in six months' time, the whole uh, operation is going to fall apart once the Russians capture Bakhmut and more additional strategic cities in the Donbass region. The Ukrainian government's going to collapse. It's completely. It's just being propped up by Western. This why this, this why it's a crusade. The, the Western countries were looting our own treasuries to keep this project going uh, in Ukraine. Yeah. The United States has spent over a hundred billion dollars so far, and you have and they're using Jesuitical uh, the ends justify the means doctrines uh, by saying that this, we're going to be with Ukraine for as long as it takes. So they, you know, and we'll spend as much as it takes. So they've already spent a hundred billion. Now they they could spend two hundred billion, five hundred billion, a trillion, five trillion. They're going to spend as much as it takes. The ends justify the means. Well, uh, but but here's, here's the comments, George. You had the CIA director, William Burns, <clears throat> said this past Thursday that the next six months would be critical in the war in Ukraine with Russia, uh, with Vladimir Putin betting that waning Western interest and in political could afford <clears throat> his military a new chance at making battlefield gains. He, he, he talks about how. Uh, Putin refuses to negotiate. Yeah, he says we do not assess that Putin is serious about negotiations, and this is where like that's a that's a total lie. I don't, I don't know if you saw the re revelations recently about the Angela Merkel, the former German Chancellor. Of course, she won the Roman Catholic Charlemagne Prize. <laughs> uh, she's a puppet of the Vatican Empire. Uh, but a Angela Merkel admitted that the Minsk agreements that was the initial peace accord that was set up in 2015 that would have prevented this whole war from breaking out but the, she wrote that ukraine actually had no intention of honoring the minsk agreements and that it was all designed to give the ukrainian military more time to arm up for this inevitable conflict that we're they're in now with russia well and, and of course the uh the head of the president of ukraine is Volodymyr Zelensky. we've talked about him before he's a known freemason he's a member of the world economic forum he's had at least one papal audience so, and you know, I, I don't mean to belabor this, but um, he did a, a video, I, I guess a TikTok video back in 2014, where it's basically a knockoff of the village people, where he's wearing high heels and leather, and is he in Ukrainian? And it's just like, um, this has been basically pulled from online. So, he, as I said, he's an actor, he's a comedian, he's an entertainer. So, he's just simply an actor playing a part. I mean, he literally is an actor. He is paid to read other people's lines. Well, dude, he so, played the Ukrainian president on TV before uh, he, he became yeah, the that, Ukrainian president. Yeah, so talk about predictive programming. And he's had, and, and he, you're saying he's he's had all, like, he's had all these supposed, like, most of his, um, most of the times he's on camera, he's behind a green screen somewhere. So like, but a lot of people don't even know like where he is. But you have all these Western officials flying in to see him. Like just recently, the CIA director flew in to see him in Ukraine, and they they put out this propaganda that the CIA director William Burns and Zelensky had to duck in, in into bunkers due to reckless Russian aggression. Um, you see here, uh, but but George William Burns this week he uh, he was given an award by Jesuit Georgetown University. Um, he says here, Burns engaged in a moderate, moderated discussion at Jesuit Georgetown University Thursday, where he was being awarded the Trainer Award for Excellence in Conduct of Diplomacy. And this is this is amazing too, like how just because you know William Burns. And here, this article shows this here from Countercurrents. Diplomatic cables prove top U.S. officials knew they were crossing Russia's red lines. William Burns was writing memo after memo in 2008, w saying that if we keep arming Ukraine, Ukraine became the most armed uh, military in Europe due to American uh, training and weapons shipments. He, he, he warns that if we keep arming Ukraine, that Russia is going to get involved in taking territory in eastern Ukraine. He was writing this all the way back in tw 2008. Uh, but this, this is a very good very good article that covers this uh, with the current CIA director, William Burns. Diplomatic cables prove top U.S. officials knew they were crossing Russia's red line on NATO expansion. Um, and George, the, a lot of people, I just don't see it get brought up, but the current CIA director, William Burns, is openly a Roman Catholic, which is kind of you know par for the course with CIA directors. They're known as Catholics in action. Um, 
here he is here, William Burns, eighth director of the CIA, educated at Roman Catholic LaSalle University. Go to his education. Uh, here. Yeah, LaSalle University, which is a private Catholic university in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, founded by the Christian Brothers. And then the current CIA director, George, also went to the Counter Reformation College in Oxford, St. John's College. Here, its founder, Sir Thomas White, intended to provide a source of educated Roman Catholic clerics to support the Counter Reformation undo the Protestant influence in England. Ah, uh, well... And the CIA director's wife, George, also is involved with the Jesuits, Lisa Cardi. She's currently the United Nations Economic uh, Ambassador to the United Nations Economic and Social Council, representing the United States. And she went to Jesuit Georgetown University. Okay, uh, so, sorry, so we, mentioned, and we mentioned that earlier on the show, and this kind of ties into what General Holbert was saying here, how he says, if an H-bomb war is ever launched, it will not be by accident by some overwrought pilot of an H-bomb plane flying beyond its assigned mission, but by a homicidal Roman Catholic maniac in the White House, the State Department, or the Pentagon, who is already in a position to give the command and who has been briefed for this assignment. Surely Mr. Khrushchev, and just like Putin today, is too well informed not to realize that he can never attain total disarmament as long as the Jesuit Vatican forces dominate our foreign policy. So you have all the top brass. You have the CIA director educated by the Jesuits and is Catholic. You got the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, is Catholic. You got the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, is Catholic. The, the, the President of the United States is Roman Catholic, Joe Biden educated by the Jesuits, the whole, like the, the whole top leadership. And that's why I think that's, and that, that's, there's no coincidence. They have all top Catholics in the leadership of the United States military and the government. And now the U S is drifting as close as they have towards a third world war. Well, you know, you're talking about big name players, like um, the president of the United States. And we were talking earlier about um, Justin Castro, Castro, Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, but, um, Something I wanted to mention is a smaller fiefdoms. We talked earlier about the chief of police in Yakima, Washington, um, Matt Murray, who got his undergrad degree from Regis University in Denver, Colorado. If I could just mention how the whore has hegemony in other small jurisdictions, you know, it's almost comical. Um, I just came across this. I got an email last week from somebody from Perth, Australia, and he said, his name is Hilakaya, and he was saying, you know, where he lives and how the charity has been really uh, egregious for the last several years. It's not quite as bad now, but um, I was only vaguely familiar with Perth, and I just found out that it's actually in West Australia. Now, when people have talked about what's been going on in the so-called land down under over the last few years, they'll talk about the East, places like New South Wales, um, Victoria, the Northern territories but um new, the um the western australia has a population of about two million people and almost all of those people live in or near perth and i was looking into so who's running that uh, district well it turns out the attorney general for uh, for new south wales is john quigley and he's a devout irish roman catholic and he went to aquinas college in perth now, as I said, Western Australia has a, only a couple million people, so it's a relatively small place. But even in that region, they have control. Well, I know during the CV-19 lockdowns, one of the biggest tyrants in Australia was the Premier of Victoria, Dan Andrews, who is a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he yeah. was commonly referred to as Dictator Dan. He, he enforced some of the strictest lockdowns in the world outside of communist China. Ah, yes. And who, who you know, you mentioned uh, Dan uh, Andrews. And um, then there's also Michael Gunner, who, who, who was like uh, giving him a run for his money. And who, who oh, yeah. the, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't Gunner set up the uh, detention camps? Yes, for the Aborigines. Wow. 
Well, that's that's the Jesuits have been doing that for hundreds of years. Uh, okay, so now just just to give you something a little bit closer to home. Now I mentioned the West Coast, Yakima, Washington. Well, as you, I mentioned before, I live in Sonoma County, California, which is just north of San Francisco. Well, our current after New Year's, we got a, a new district attorney, uh, Carla Rodriguez. She got her undergrad degree from St. Mary's College in La Moraga, which is Catholic, and she got her law degree from University of San Francisco. Rodriguez replaces Jill Ravitch, who was there from 2010 till last year. She also got her law degree from University of San Francisco. Ravitch replaced a fellow by the name of Michael Mullins, who was a district attorney from 1994 to 2010. Mullins, if you look at his education, is purely secular, but after he left the DA's office, he became the chief legal counsel for Catholic charities for Northern California. Now, <coughs> uh, Mullins replaced uh, Gene Tunney, who was a district attorney from 1974 to 1994. There again, he got his law degree from the University of San Francisco. So just prior to Tunney, you had a fellow named John Hawks, who was ostensibly a Protestant. He was a member of a non-denominational congregation. But it said in his obituary in 2005, he was a member of Lodge 57. So that means the Jesuits, one way or the other, have controlled the district attorney's office of this county for over half a century. No, oh, that, that's profound control. It's almost that, kind of, that reminds me of the the Speaker of the House. I think I I think it just was recently broken because I think Kevin McCarthy is officially a Baptist. Yeah, but, but before McCarthy, you had had to have been at least five to six direct, like back to back to back to back to back Roman Catholics. So and, he, uh, and recently, George, I don't know if you saw it, the Democrat the the new the Democrats win the House. House again in the next election cycle. The new Speaker of the House will be Akeem Jeffries. Uh, and he went to Jesuit Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. So, well, the, 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 so the tradition is going to keep uh, keep going on. Well, you know, it's a similar thing in terms of the governor of Pennsylvania. The current one is uh, who just took office is J Josh Shapiro. I believe he got his undergrad degree from Georgetown. He's Jewish. And he previously was the attorney general for Pennsylvania. But you had Todd Wolf, who was not only Protestant Methodist or something. Uh, but before Wolf, you had a long string of like five or six openly Roman Catholic governors of uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So it's a similar thing with the uh, U.S. Speaker of the House. Um, now, how many prime ministers of Canada have been openly Catholic? Well, you have Justin, you know, you had his his mom's husband Pierre. Notice I called him. Notice that I called him uh, his mom's husband Pierre. You, you, you had Mulroney, you had Joe Clark, uh, you had Christian. What ten? So you had something like ten Catholic prime ministers there. You're saying with Mulrooney too. He's uh, he's now, uh, or at least I don't know if he's still there, but he was on the board of directors for a while at the Blackstone Group. Ah, uh, massive American uh, hedge fund in New York City. Ah, uh, it's interesting that Mulrooney, uh, after becoming after being prime minister of Canada, well, that's par for the course, you know, because it's it's a revolving door. Um, but uh, yeah, Mulrooney joined Blackstone Group. Yeah, the, the Canada, the, the most actually. There's a Wikipedia article on this. Uh, if you go religious affiliation of Canadian prime ministers, you see that there's been more Catholic prime ministers than any other Christian sect. Yeah, so you see here a list of prime ministers. Um, Uh, let me see here. Let's, let's do control F Catholic. Yes, he had Sir John Thompson. He was in office from 1892 to 1894. He was Roman Catholic. He had Sir, Wilf Sir Wilfrid Laurier uh, from the Liberals. Uh, he was in office from 1896 to 1911. He was Roman Catholic. Uh, you had Louis Saint Laurent, president from 1948 to 1957. Another liberal, Roman Catholic. You have Pierre Trudeau, liberal, Roman Catholic. He was educated by the Jesuits. Uh, in office from 68 to 79 and from 1980 to 1984. 
We had Joe Clark from the Conservatives. He was Catholic. He was Prime Minister from 1979 to 1980. You had John Turner from the Liberal Party. He was Catholic. He was Prime Minister briefly from June 1984 to September 1984. Like you mentioned Brian Mulroney. He was Conservative. He was Catholic. Uh, and he, you know, Mulroney has received Jesuit honorary degrees since he left office, too. Uh, he's kind of known as Canada's Ronald Reagan. He essentially took all the Reagan's Reaganomics platform and implemented it into Canada. Well, well speaking of Ronald Reagan, he was in office from 1984 to 1993. Then you got Jean Chrétien in office from 1993 to 2003 from the Liberal Party. Then you got Paul Martin, Liberal, in office from 2003 to 2006. He was Catholic, and then Justin Trudeau. So that's so. There's been more Catholics than any other religion. Uh, affiliation of Christians, uh, Christian sex and, uh, as Canadian prime ministers, which is fitting because there's, if you think about Canada, just the way the education system set up here, no other Christian sect has like an edu like a, a school board even, but the Catholic well, church has half of the schools across the country and they're, they're federally funded. So non-Catholics in Canada pay for all of the Catholic schools. Well, you know, I just mentioned our, our district attorneys here, how, Rome has controlled the district attorney's office since the early 1970s, at the latest. Um, and I had to look more into that. Well, we have three uh, hospitals, and they have some of them have satellite branches. But you have Sutter Health in Sonoma County, Kaiser Permanente, and you have uh, Providence, which used to be known as St. Joseph's. It was all emerged um, last decade or so. Uh, Catholic Healthcare West and St. Joseph's merged into Providence. So one of the three hospitals in this county is openly Catholic. Now, uh, there's a figure here who works for a subtle hospital named Dr. Gary Green. Um, he, you probably never heard of him because you don't live here, but he's done, for the last three years, our county board of supervisors have done uh, regular COVID updates. It used to be daily, then it was weekly, now it's monthly. Um, so Green has been a regular guest on these updates. Now, he, as I said, works for Central Hospital Santa Rosa, and he got his medical degree from Georgetown University. So he's all on board. Uh, how should all, he's been all on board for these measures, and he said he's irritated that there hasn't been enough tyranny imposed on this county. Um <laughs> Well, that's par for the course. Well, George, maybe before we have time today, I want to read the quote from Pope Francis from his book that he wrote, uh, not a well-known book at all, a short book he wrote in 2020 called Life After the Pandemic. And Pope Jesuit, the current Jesuit Pope Francis uh, gives support for the authoritarian COVID lockdowns and gives typical misinformation tropes that, say, and he says that if we didn't lock down, millions of people would have died in a viral genocide. So, so I, we'll, we'll read those quotes from Pope Francis. Uh, actually, now, now, now that I have them up, actually, I'll just uh, I'll bring that up, actually, while, now that we're on the topic. Uh, here's the quote. Actually, I have it here in this comment feed. This is the book called Life After the Pandemic. Pope Francis says this on page 25 uh, and 26. So this is from the Jesuit Pope. He says, some governments have taken exemplary measures with clear priorities to defend the people in their respective countries. So he's probably talking about communist China there and uh australia it's definitely canada with our authoritarian measures so that that's he says some governments have taken exemplary measures he's not talking about sweden who didn't do a lockdown he's talking about the countries that did lockdown as the ones that are exemplary and then francis continues it is true that these measures are burdensome for those who find themselves obliged to observe them but it is always for the common good it's always for the common good george <laughs> According to Pope Francis, the authoritarian lockdowns um, that weren't based on science at all, but it, it's always for the common good, and on the whole, for the majority, and on and on the whole, the majority of people accept them and approach them with a positive attitude. <laughs> uh, Pope Francis continues: Governments who approach the crisis in this way demonstrate the priority of their decision making. People first. This is important because we all realize that defending the people of a country in the current situation entails economic hardship. That's right. You have to entail economic hardship <laughs> to, to create this new order that has been the new uh, feudal order 
Well, this is what the, the Catholic priest Philip Larey calls Pope Francis capitalism 2.0. It's where you systemically uh, transfer wealth from small businesses into the hands of established cartels and monopolies. Uh, but Pope Francis continues, however, it would be tragic if the opposite was prioritized. So if, the, if, you, if you kept the, if you stayed free, <laughs> it would be tragic. Uh, because this would lead to the death of many people, and in one sense, a kind of viral genocide. <laughs> so that, that that that's so like that that's like the most you know typical COVID misinformation tropes that you hear on the AM radio and on the news, mainstream media, twenty four seven. And here's Pope Francis saying that in his book, and here's the book that he said it in, called "Life After the Pandemic." <laughs> the preface was by a Canadian cardinal and Jesuit, Michael Sersny. SJ, but there's the title of the book there. Well, actually, and George, it looks like Johnny just rolled in. I sent out an invitation to Johnny. Hey, Johnny, nice to see you, man. Hey, guys, good to see you. I have got to fire up um, my own stream, but I was so excited to get the invite that I wanted to stop by. Um, and um, I've got uh, Mike Gill on hold. I got to call him and I've got the team waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm 20 minutes overdue, but uh, really, really thrilled to, to just stop by and, and say, Hey, to, to both of you. I was setting up the stream of George and I, I was thinking of you when I was sending out the invites. So I, I, I sent one out and uh, th this week, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, one of our, it was, a, this one seems to be good, but, the censors took down a stream I did with you in 2021, and I put that back up there. And it seems to be holding strong right now. So that got me thinking of you too. It was a chat we did a couple of years ago on the right. This was right before Joe Biden came into office. Yeah, there's there's no rhyme or reason to why something gets taken down. We we have done when 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 uh, we were working together with uh, with Nick. Nick was like, okay, we'll we'll take the title and put it backwards, and then put it upside down. And then do it and then pat your head and rub your stomach and then hop on one foot. There's no rhyme or reason. When they took down my original, my original channel, which I had clawed 5,000 subs over years worth of work, um, all they did was go back through all of my videos and they took uh, like three or four vids that I had of local news. The local news <coughs> that had... Um, denied the official narrative on mass shootings. It wasn't me. It wasn't copyrighted. It was simply local news denying a mass shooting, the, the, uh, the typical, the, the official narrative. And that is what they used to quickly throw together three bullshit strikes to obliterate my, my very first YouTube channel. So there's, there's, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason. And, and excuse me, I have, I have recommended to people, repeatedly don't change who you are don't attempt to um appeal to what you think is going to help you don't appeal to uh what you think may get you good numbers don't appeal to what you think may keep you out of trouble because it's it's not going to work be yourself go for the truth as you know best and and let things happen and and if and if that means that you've got to go to alternative sources, then go to alternative sources because uh, the U YouTube and the internet is filled with compromisers, and and that's why we're in the situation situation that we're in now. Oh, so keep being yourself. YouTube is completely, completely controlled at this point, and that's why for me, I I I, I should actually I have the channels set up, I, I but I ideally like I should be uploading to Odyssey and Rumble primarily, and not YouTube because. Uh, the, 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 that's the reason also I have, why I had to take a break the last few months here is because they were constantly, they were doing this system where they would give me a strike. Uh, or I, was, I was always having two strikes where they would give me a strike and then another one. So I have to wait for two weeks and then, and or it's three, it's a three month period where if you get a third one, they permanently delete you. So then for that three month period, I, I'm kind of paralyzed on the channel. I can't do anything. So then when one of those strikes would go off where I'm free to, safely upload videos under, without the threat of being banned, they'll throw another strike on me from a video I did eight or nine months ago. And now I'm back up to two strikes 
and the next video I upload could potentially permanently ban the channel. And I, and for me, like I just didn't, I didn't want to risk having all these videos that we've done over the years being, you know, permanently gone. I, I promise you, these are human beings making these decisions, bro. These are human beings. These are not bots. We are, we are below, even though you and I have no visibility, I promise you because of the power of truth in our reporting that we rate human beings making these decisions. These are not bots making these decisions. So there don't, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to dodge it. Find, find your mechanism. That's going to work for you to include, um, not, not relying per se on a particular, on a particular hub, but absolutely mirroring, continue to mirror on, uh, Odyssey and rumble and wherever else that you may have an account just because it's going to help. Uh, as soon as they kick you from YouTube, they've won. I found that in general, uh, any alternative hub, you're down, you're down to about 10% of what you'd normally get on YouTube. That's why they stole YouTube. So, so they won no matter what, but wh where, what do you do? do? Do you just quit? Do you throw in the flag, uh, throw in the towel, uh, or you keep going? So just, just mirror your stuff. I, I know you've got a, uh, an odyssey cause I'm subscribed to it. Continue to take the time and cost benefit analysis too. How much time is it worth to you? So, you know, I, I maintain uh, an Odyssey, a bit shoot, a, a Rumble, uh, Brighteon, huge tube. And honestly, it goes downhill from there. I, I start from like, you know, maybe two or 300 views on Odyssey down to 100 views on, on um, bit shoot, down to, you know, 10, 15, 20 views on uh, Rumble and, and, Bright, and Brighteon, and then down like five on huge tube cost benefit analysis and you've got to make that decision yourself. So. No, I, I agree with that 100%. And for me, that's what, that's why I, I took the, I took the cautious route and trying to, trying to keep the YouTube channel up just cause like, yeah, just cause I saw like what my, my channels on Odyssey and rumble will get probably not even like 5% of the traffic that's, that's all they want. Well, yeah, they won. So keep going. But but if you're inspired to stream and you're in a holding pattern on YouTube, then keep yourself going with the alternatives and then go back to YouTube as you're able. Uh don't 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 let these bastards crush your creativity. Keep uh keep working because the people that need it will will get to it. It's just I, I've been to the point where um all right, do I need to stop and just write books? Do we need to stop writing books and go and, and live stream? it's really just tough decisions to make because the analytics will betray you. You're not going to get a good snapshot of your reality by, by what the internet tells you are the numbers that you're getting. You have to try and, and, and discern where you're going to have the most impact yourself. And because your, your, your focus is truth, you're already terribly handicapped. So oh, YouTube's so controlled with the algorithm. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen this guy, but I, I've, I actually, I'm going to look into his Jesuit backgrounds because I'm sure it's some CIA or Vatican operation, but YouTube is so controlled with the algorithms. I'm sure you've seen that show, the Lex Friedman podcast. And it's the most algorithmically promoted show like in the world. So like anytime I'm watching any video that's somewhat related to politics or the news, the next video that comes up in my stream is the Lex Friedman. I can't even tell you how many times I've fallen asleep on my couch watching <laughs> a podcast and I'll wake up and wake the Lex, up the Lex Friedman, Friedman podcast is on. It's funny. Uh, I, I'm going through the same thing with um, uh, Jordan Peterson. And, and no offense to Jordan Peterson. I just, uh, I'm I'm now, I'm uh, let it run in the background. Patrick bet David in his valuetainment interviewing Jordan Peterson. And I'm I'm, I'm watching this interview. I'm like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. It's the machine decided that because Jordan Peterson is going to kick back a little bit, he's going to question uh, extreme feminism. He's going to question scandemic tyranny. He's the one that's allowed to be a superhero just because he's, he's moderately kicking back. He in no way, shape or form is dangerous to the machine. He probably doesn't even realize it, but the machine, because he sort of kicks back and he's not dangerous. He gets hugely promoted. He's hugely same thing with a, um, a supposed fundamentalist evangelical pastor named Steve Chicolante, who uh, wrote a book on what a superhero Donald Trump is. And the book went super viral on Amazon. Go figure Steve. 
um, it's the machine picks it. So anytime that somebody is popular, that immediately is is uh, a flag. That's immediately a bad sign. Oh, it's Hello, okay. no, jump, jump in on George, but I, I just wanted to get into your point about how like there's human beings doing this. This just for me, that was proven at least on my channel when I had in the same week, I had Georgetown University uh, issue me two strikes and I had Loyola University in uh, Los Angeles, Loyola Marymount. So I had, I had two different Jesuit universities issue me three separate copyright strikes in the span of a week. Uh, so I, I And this was actually... Right after we had that uh, figure, Veritas, Aquitas, uh, with the, oh, right, yeah. that supposed guy that's on our side, um, he gave me a strike too for sharing and promoting one of his videos because I, I had a bigger channel than him. <laughs> so this wow. is me giving his videos more exposure. Um, so, you know, it's a, a, that to me, that shows that there's, you know, there's human beings, you know, and ultimately individuals working within the Jesuit power structure well, that are orchestrating this. Brother, you got a bigger reach than I do. You definitely got a bigger reach. I have never had, excuse me, so much reach that I had Georgetown and Fordham give me a hard time. I I figured Veritas Aquitas was uh, controlled opposition by the way that he quickly ran to the aid of Eric Phelps when I started to criticize Eric on his racism and his his uh, Jesuit eschatology, promoting futurism, promoting Zionism. And, uh, and I spoke to this guy on the phone and he tried to convince me that, uh, uh, accept Eric without question, uh, as, as great as, as insights as Eric can provide, he still is a tremendous handicap with his racism. And like I said, his Jesuit eschatology. So, uh, well, I think, I think we'll, I know George would be a good guy to talk about that. Cause I know George has been in chat with him. Like I and just, from what I've seen, it seems that Phelps has toned down that rhetorics after we you've launched those uh and i think those are uh genuine critiques of him because I, anytime you're using racist or racial kind of uh inflammatory dialogue it turns people off from hearing your message oh, yeah, george, george what, what, how would you judge that uh no no speak of english yeah so, so says the guy who is a regular guest and i'm glad that george is i'm glad that george is a regular guest he does a lot of good for eric and, and honestly some some of those most of those interviews uh i just loop around because they they end up being great interviews and the only time i can't listen is when uh eric goes off on a on a uh a white power rant um but 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 george's guest appearances with eric have, have been fantastic um listen i've got to uh start my own uh my own stream you guys i'll i'll send um invitations be thrilled to have you. I've also got to have a call from uh, Mike Gill, but uh, really excited to see you both. Uh, Eric, always, always a pleasure after, you know, the long hiatus between us and hope that we can continue to, to uh, connect no matter what. It's tough when we have such uh, busy schedules, but you're, you're high on my list, brother. I promise you. Oh, it's great to see you too, Johnny. I'll, I'll keep in touch. I'll definitely love to get a full stream with you going soon. Okay. All right. John, may I mention something before you jump out? Sure, good. Sure, good. Well, I'm glad. Um, by the way, I'm waving. Um, I'm sorry. I don't have my olive branch, but um, I, I hope we had a we had a bit of a disagreement. I, I hope we can reconcile. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't want to talk about this publicly. I'm just teasing. No, George, I'll give you a call as, as I am able to. Just super, super busy. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's no, um, there, there's no animosity at all, dude. I, I, uh, good. I mean, so if I did, cause I, as you know, I do, uh, I phone into Zach. I've never, a Zach Hubbard show. I've been doing that for about a year or so. <laughs> and I've never, I've never actually been a guest there. So I, I talked to him five, 10 minutes. And one of the things that Zach mentioned is, Hey, has Johnny considered going back onto YouTube? Now, I realize you need to learn a whole new language like Swahili or something in terms of all the all the euphemisms you would have to use. For example, calling the vaccine the hokey pokey or something like, like that. And instead of saying. False yeah, let me, let me address that. Let me address that, pal. Um, in order to 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 do a YouTube, I need to create another Gmail and I need to tie myself in with a whole new set of logins. Um, th this is the game they play because there's the Google YouTube, Gmail, conglomerate. That requires a whole system 
for you to do. And, and you have to have these or throw away because there's no right. You know, I, I, I have been threatened by YouTube to lose my current account that I don't even use because I made comments that they don't like. They were going to take, they were going to take my, 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 the, the current YouTube. All I do is I use the current YouTube to tie in with my current Gmail with my contacts uh, and my calendar because of friggin' uh, uh, Leviathan YouTube is in, in everything. Um, and they were going to take my account just because of the comments I was making on other people's videos. So it's just, they, they are just so freaking vicious. So, so Stalinist vicious. Um, it's not worth it, but, but uh, tell Zach much love to him and, and love to connect with him as well. And um, it's just cost benefit analysis, man. Uh, they would, they would hack me. They would take me down so quickly. Um, you know, the, the example, they're going back two years, two years to, uh, to take down a vid that I, that I did with Eric. And they, I don't have the patience for it, man, but uh, much love to you both and, and stay in touch and we'll continue to work on it. And well, actually, recently, it, did you guys see that uh, they, YouTube, did, did, this was like a high profile video that was just taken down recently, that Project Veritas video of the Pfizer executive that was caught talking yeah, about the and directed evolution? I, I think I think the reason they did that is because uh, O'Keefe needs needs validation. Uh, people are starting to question whether or not he's uh, controlled opposition and the guy that um, is waiting for me to call him right now, Mike Gill, has proof that James O'Keefe is just that, an, an Irish Roman Catholic millionaire controlled opposition. Because Mike Gill gave him evidence of extreme corruption of uh, that idiot that, that calls herself Jean Shaheen, her husband, William Shaheen, the lawyer up there in New Hampshire, the Sununu family, Daddy Sununu, Baby Sununu, that's like the governor up there, the IRS, the FBI, all in it together. He handed that to O'Keefe, and O'Keefe turned around and gave that to the IRS and FBI because he's a piece of crap. So did Ben Swan. They were both in on it. And uh, the 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 as far as I'm concerned, I've seen virus isolation. Excuse me. And so weaponizing something that doesn't exist is impossible. So this is this is controlled opposition. If we don't question the entire germ theory paradigm. They will be able to continue to do scamdemic after scamdemic after scamdemic. That's why they have this this phony. Uh, oh, did you did you know the name of the restaurant? Ignacio's. Ignacio's there in Brooklyn. Nobody that was, was in the there. restaurant. It, it, it not, that, that's where that whole scene took place. Where the uh, that's the that was the guy like bar. That was the the restaurant in Brooklyn where nobody was there. It was Ignacio's. And they've Ignacio. got the Kraken on the window. They've got the creepy Catholic Jesus and the creepy Catholic uh, Queen of Heaven, Virgin Mary, on the wall. Complete setup, guys. Complete setup. Um, no, no, I'm, looking for, I'm looking forward to hearing that uh, that interview about uh, Project Veritas. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact... Because um, it's very likely he could just be like another like Alex Jones, like CIA type of figure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, Johnny, if I may say so. So you said Mike Gill... Uh, gave uh, James O'Keefe information about the corruption in his state. So it sounded almost like a Noam Chomsky situation with uh, Pat, Til Pat Tillman. Sure, sure. And I don't know for sure that Chomsky did that. I've, it, it's possible that Chomsky's email were just being um, hacked by the CIA. But I am convinced that, uh, that, it was, that it was Tillman contacting Chomsky and telling Chomsky that when he gets back, He's going to be a whistleblower on the fraud of the global war on terror. That that's what got him killed. Uh, but yeah, very very. You know, Chom Chomsky's a huge fraud. He, he's received Jesuit honorary degrees. He, I believe he even lived with Jesuits. He lived with the South Jesuits. America. Yes, he did in South America. Yeah. And you remember he was one of the biggest COVID authoritarians in like the intellectual space. In he was calling for the unvaxxed to be like herded away into camps yep. and they be completely segregated. Let's, let's, them let's, to, let's not let forget all people to lose their jobs and all that. All three of his degrees. Uh, his bachelor's, his master's, and his doctorate came from the, the secret Jesuit University of Pennsylvania. He's a, he's a master linguist because the Jesuits gave him all of his, all of his credibility in, in language. Um, the only well, reason... Absolutely. Yeah. I 100% I, I agree. I think he's a total fraud. And the only time I've seen him really bring up the Vatican is making it seem like the United States government was persecuting <laughs> right. the Catholic Church right. in Central America, right. which is totally laughable. Just, just like that blockbuster Mother Jones article on the ties between the CIA and intelligence and OSS, 
with the Vatican that spins it to make it look like it's actually the CIA that, that, that bitch slaps the Vatican when it's completely the other way around. As a matter of fact, there's a reason why uh, the nickname of the CIA is the company, which uh, it predates the, the original company predates that by several, several hundred years. And that's the Jesuits. The nickname of the Jesuits is the company. What else did I see? Some well, other you, Johnny, actually, we, we were bringing up on the stream earlier, the CIA director, William Burns, just received an award at Georgetown University a couple of days ago. Uh, he was speaking about the, the crusade going on in Ukraine. But the current <laughs> director, par for the course, William Burns, is, uh, is a Roman Catholic educated at LaSalle University. And his wife, who is a United States uh, diplomat to the United Nations, uh, went to Georgetown University. And William Burns, the current CIA director, he was writing all these memos back in 2008 saying, if we keep this current track going on of arming Ukraine, uh, and, and, and if we, you know, then with the NATOization of Ukraine, you know, they, they, he writes in these memos that Russia is eventually going to get involved in Eastern Ukraine and start seizing territory if we keep mingling in their in their backyard and they, they kept doing it for 12 years and predicting that with the cia made on coup in 2014 and how he brought up how they've created a whole new sect of the orthodox church to weaken the russian orthodox church to then eventually swallow the whole of the orthodox community into the catholic fabric i think that's what we're seeing play out uh, good for you good Ukraine. for you and, and because of you i looked this guy up not only is he LaSalle, but he's St. John's Oxford. St. John's Oxford was the premier counter-reformation Jesuit college, which all of a sudden now they're, you know, whatever they are, private now. They're not, they're not Catholic anymore. They're not counter-reformation. That is their roots. Uh, the same way that George makes those great points about um, University of Vienna, supposedly the public University of Vienna, where it used to be hyper-devout Jesuit, vicious counter-reformation, and you've got guys like uh, Sigmund, Sigmund Fraud and many big names coming out of years for Vienna. Same thing with St. John's Oxford. Well done. I'm going to now archive this clown. Uh, you, you, see how, you see how communist far-left Roman Catholic Joe Biden got rid of all of Trump's, Trump's um, Jesuits and Catholics and replaced them with Jews because it's so important to the Catholic machine to distract with Jews. But um, the, the, the real decision makers, the war makers, the drug traffickers, the human traffickers, the decision makers, those are the secret closet Jesuits, not the Jesuits. Well, I, think we, 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 I know you got to get going here, Johnny, but we brought up on this stream today. So you got in terms of the U.S., the United States military command structure, the commander in chief, Joe Biden, devout Roman Catholic, Jesuit educated. Uh, you got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley. Roman Catholic was an altar boy in his youth. You got the Secretary of Defense with the Secretary of Offense, <laughs> Lloyd Off Lloyd Austin, Roman Catholic, and then you got the CIA Director William Burns, openly being a Roman Catholic. So th those are the those are the key. And you got the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, Roman Catholic, educated at Jesuit Georgetown University. So you have all of the key military uh, administrative posts in the hands of Roman Catholics, and we're seeing this crusade take place uh in ukraine now absolutely well, John, johnny um, God, we're, we're talking about major power players but something uh eric and i were talking about earlier was how much hegemony the the whore has in relatively small fiefdoms for example um somebody emailed me from perth australia which is in the western part of australia it's called western australia now western australia only has about two million people and almost all those people live in or near perth However, the Attorney General for Western Australia is John Quigley, who is a devout Irish Roman Catholic and went to Aquinas College in uh, Perth. So that's just like a, an isolated example. Um, the chief of police in Yakima, Washington, uh, Matt Murray, uh, where they just had a, a false flag last week um, at a convenience store, he got his undergrad degree from Regis College or Regis University in Denver, Colorado. So Yakima has a population of maybe 100,000 people. So you're talking about relatively small jurisdictions. But even there, the, the machine has control. Yeah, agreed, George. In fact, um, not surprisingly, you know, Quigley is a, is a very popular, I think it's Irish Catholic. It, it was the um, bishop. Is he a bishop or a cardinal? 
um, James Edward Quigley that pinned the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, column in 1903 that said, as soon as we finish controlling education, we will rule the world from America. Oh, so, absolutely. Actually, Johnny, I have that. Uh, yeah, that's actually a perfect segue here. I have that article up on my uh, blog, Jesuit World Order, from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he also says that when the Catholic Church rules the world, the United, or when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. That's right. Here's the uh, people go on to Reddit to Jesuit World Order. I'm just going to pull that up here, you know, because that, that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, that that's one of the biggest that 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 remind that's like the E. Howard Hunt quote where he's the CIA official where he says uh, the Jesuits form the greatest intelligence service in the world and always that, have. That, that was. That was from the um, a coup made in America in relation to uh, Jacob Ora Benz, the overthrow of Jacob Ora Benz there in Guatemala. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the Canadian documentary "A Coup Made in America," yeah. And we were we were talking earlier in the stream, like we we're saying, like probably a very minuscule amount of Americans are aware that Hunt made those comments. Right, right. Or oh. or that Hunt was converted to Roman Catholicism by uh, um, William Francis Buckley Jr. Uh, a skull and bones, Yale CIA man, world renowned as a conservatory propagandist, as the founder of of National Review. Gee, oh, great point! Is that why uh, Hunt named his son uh, with Saint John Hunt? Um, pro probably because he, he probably was was following uh, Templar Johannism, which is the heresy, the Roman Catholic uh, Templar heresy, which states that Jesus Christ was a phony messiah and that the real messiah was john the baptist which is why they shit themselves selves over cutting people's heads off which is why all the phony cia jihadis cut heads off no entity has has beheaded more people than this sovereign city state of rome that's why uh guillotine was a jesuit the 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 the, the monster that the french monster that created that was a jesuit that's they're they're obsessed with it because, was he, wasn't his name too, like Ignace? Ignace. That's right. That's right. Guillotine. His name is Ignace, uh, Ignace Guillotine. Yeah. Uh, named <laughs> after Lo uh, Loyola. Go ahead. Well, you know, here, here's a little factoid. If I can just throw you a curveball. Uh, originally, um, Adam Rich, who was a TV actor from the 1970s, he was probably best known as Nicholas on the TV show Age is Enough, which ran on ABC in America from 1977 to 81. So why did I bring up this Useless trivia. Well, the main, the father of the family uh, was named Tom Brady, as it just so happens. Uh, Thomas Brady, or not Brady, um, T Tom something you know. He is based on Tom Braden, uh, who was a knight of Malta. And uh, Braden was probably best known on the CNN show Crossfire, right. where he was engaged in debates with Pat um, uh, Buchanan. Buchanan. Patrick Patrick Joseph Buchanan. Another was, Jesuit quest to him. He doesn't get Jesuit educated Knight of Columbus. At least oh. uh, tw two or three times Jesuit educated. Okay, so it, it is. So Braden, uh, he was born in 1919. I believe he died. Yeah, like 19 uh, 2008. I, I'm I'm going from memory here. Well, he was a protege of William Donovan of the OSS, and um, they were part of what was called the Billy Club. Now, I know Brain's name was Tom or Thomas, but the other members were the aforementioned Buckley, Colby, and um, uh, Casey. So the OSS basically morphed into the CIA, and uh, Brain basically became a media figure. He was a newspaper man, and he founded a newspaper in Southern California. So anyhow, the character of the father played by Dick Van Patten was based on Tom Braden. Uh, Braden had eight children. So in the TV series, uh, Dick Van Patten's character is a retired CIA agent, so he decides to become a newspaper columnist uh, in Sacramento, California. So just, yeah, it, just yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how much the uh, the Catholic Intelligence Agency has launched entertainment careers. Um, crazy, off the, like like. Um, when was the uh, the age of, of Julia Child, the cook, 
nobody knows that she has a background with the uh, OSS and, and MI6 uh, handed. I mean, all you got to do is, is um, what is the, the Laurel Kang and Dave McGowan book? It's phenomenal work that poor Dave McGowan did before he passed. Uh, that that uh, did all of it, you know, the, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Why would the intel? Why would intelligence? Why would the CIA be involved in mega destabilization to destroy uh, the United States with sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Timothy Leary, Timothy Francis, Irish Roman Catholic, Holy Cross trained Leary, Berkeley professor, uh, to an intern on and drop out, who was on the CIA payroll. So all well, roads lead to Rome. Well, I mean, one of the popular bands from that era was the Grateful Dead. And that was a pure uh, CIA creation. Uh, Jerry Garcia was a drought, well, was at least nominally uh, Mexican Roman Catholic. And um, he was sheep dipped. He was in the army. I believe he had an army intelligence background. So uh, as I said, one of the purposes for bands like the Grateful Dead was to distribute um, heroin or a a LSD and acid and other illicit drugs to their fans with impunity. This is... Uh, from the 1960s until the 1990s when Garcia actually died. And so, but there are numerous other examples of, of this, of bands or artists just being pure intelligence creations. You know, we've talked at great lengths about the Beatles. Um, now, they were a real band, but for several years, they were just, uh, probably first five or six years, just like other British groups, they were just simply journeyman cover bands. They did the popular tunes of the day, Elvis, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and so forth. But they didn't become prominent until they got involved with Tavistock in 1962. And they hired uh, George, later Sir George Barton, to be their engineer, and Brian Epstein to be their manager. Um, so the whole purpose of Epstein was to make the, peer, uh, the, the Beatles to be a Jewish creation. Yeah, um... um there's all kinds of tie-ins. I really need to go, but I'll throw this out before I do. Uh, you got a band like uh, Fleetwood Mac that was started by um, uh, another another Jewish musician, Peter Peter Greenbaum, I think, and changed his name to Peter Green. And then, surprise, surprise, uh, Peter Peter Green was seduced by uh, far left, secret Catholic communist terrorists in Germany. It was like Red Faction or something like that. And then he disappeared, and then Fleetwood Mac takes off. So um, uh, this is this is just what they do, guys. But I, it, it kills me to have to leave because I really in, in, enjoy this. But I'm I'm like two hours overdue for my own stuff. You guys are more than welcome to come over and join. Uh, send the uh, send, send the invites already. So uh, much love to you guys. Uh, let's keep working on this and let's do this again real soon. And whenever whenever comes up, especially Eric, if you're hosting, I will drop everything to come on if I'm in, in remotely available, bro. Oh, I appreciate that, Johnny. No, I know. Th thanks. Thank you so much for coming by. We should definitely do this again. Uh, we'll do. It. Love you guys. It's been, it's been a, it's been too long. So Take we care. Do it again. Well, I I need to be going at the top of the hour. It's I mean, it's, I I know it's almost three o'clock Eastern. It's about noon my my time. So, do you mind if I just mention one last thing, uh, Eric, before I sign off? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely, George. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we have George. Uh, and before you go to as I just, before we get into that, just right, this, I want to reference people. That article we were talking about with Archbishop Quigley, where he talks about the Roman Catholic, when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. That's this article here. Quigley, as an <laughs> optimist, sees wonderful growth of the Roman Catholic Church. Chicago Tribune, May 5th, 1905. And I know just, I wanted, I wanted to get this in before we sign off today, George. There's this article from United States Admiral, Naval Admiral Mark Fitzgerald. But this is from NATO's own website here. But he announced that the mission of NATO and the sovereign knights of Malta are similar. So th this that ties in right to what Archbishop Quigley said: when, when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. NATO is an effective arm of the U.S. military, and you see now that you have top U.S. naval admirals saying that NATO and the knights of Malta are similar. And here's the quote right from. Website. I just wanted to get that out before the stream finished today. Okay, so this happened a few months ago. We have a new Supreme Court justice, Kajanji Kajinji Brown Jackson, not to be confused with singer Jackson Brown. Uh, she's a black woman, and her husband Patrick is a white man. 
Well, they both profess to be Protestants. They're members of a, a local, I guess, non-denominational Protestant church in the D.C. area. Although her husband, Patrick, is a doctor at Georgetown University. I saw that. Isn't he? He's a surgeon there. He's like a lead yes. surgeon. Yes. So and then, uh, he also teaches at the medical school, I believe. Uh, yes. So I believe one or the other, they run. Rome runs all nine Supreme Court justices. You have the Peters of Protestant, or one or two Gorsuch is Episcopalian, which is the American version of the Anglican Church, and you have. One, it was a Briard retired. So five or six of the judges are openly Catholic. One is non denominational, one is Jewish. So they basically, either through the Federalist Society, which is supposed to be conservative, or through the Constitutionalist Society, they, they run the rest. Um, the Constitutionalist Society it was founded by Peter Rubin, who got his law degree from Georgetown University. So they run all nine judges. Actually, yeah, I, I did an article on uh, Jesuit World Order about that. Uh, yeah, specifically on this topic, how all nine justices are directly controlled by the Jesuits. Because I, I tied in, this was before Katanji Brown-Jackson joined. And actually, I cover her in this article as well. But this is, but I guess, when uh, Stephen Breyer was holding her seat. This was right at the end of Breyer's term that I wrote this. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I connected that all three of the Jewish Supreme Court justices that have been on the United States Supreme Court since nights uh, or since that since the Jesuits began awarding the Stein Prize out in 1976 have all received that Jesuit prize. Yes, so yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so that being Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan. And here's actually I even have a photo of Elena Kagan at Jesuit Fordham University receiving her Stein Prize. Okay, and of course, the aforementioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg husband, Martin, was an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law. So, um, and of course, something that uh, Barack Obama mentioned after the death of um, uh, Scalia, Anthony Scalia, was he talked about his background and his childhood and all that sort of stuff. But... <laughs> One of the things he, uh, Obama brought up about Scalia is that even though um, he and Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, were bitter enemies when it came to law, they were actually friends in real life. As a matter of fact, they would li like to go to the opera together. So they, they, they and their spouses would go uh, to the Met. So he did this strike you odd because you, you know uh, Scalia was supposed to be conservative, traditional, originalist. And yeah, you know, we know about the views of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but well, it's, the hard, it's, it's the opposite side of the end of the Jesuit dialectic, just the fault, the phony right and the phony left. Like here, I, I don't well, even see my screen. I got an article up from Jesuit Fordham Law. This is covering Ruth Bader Ginsburg holds court at Fordham Law. So she she spoke at Fordham numerous times, but she and she, but she she received the the Stein Prize as a distinct legal award given out by the Jesuits at Fordham. <coughs> Usually it gets attorney generals that receive it or state DAs that get it or numerous Supreme Court justices have received the award. And just you got to think common sense wise, the Jesuits don't give out awards to people that resist them. They give out their oh. awards to puppets for doing their bidding. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ginsburg has uh, and her husband, you mentioned her late husband, Martin, or uh, was a professor at Jesuit Georgetown University as well. Uh, and actually, there's a video here on um, C-SPAN, I think, on this article from Ginsburg or about Ginsburg at uh, George or at Fordham. Where was the link here? Uh, yeah, here's the video. C-SPAN video here. You, you can actually see the video of Ginsburg receiving her award at Fordham. Studying for the MCAT? Once again. So we'll just put this, we'll just, I'll briefly put this on here. On national security. And the alumni and alumnae of the law school, I'm honored to present to you Dean John D. Farrick. As part of this work, so here's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, I right appreciate here. the good dean. See, there's Jesuit Fordham flag in the background. <laughs> so it's all Jesuit theater, the supposed 
left versus right uh, divide in the Supreme Court. And did you, George, did you see the new kind of demonic statue of Ruth Bader Ginsburg that just went up in New York City? Beautiful words. No, no, I didn't. But uh, as I said, one of the things that uh, it's pretty is- surreal. Actually, it's like a gold. Like this, this is crazy if you haven't seen it. Uh, okay. Well, if I can just mention something, this is a completely different topic altogether. And I do have to go after this point. Um, so one of the things that Obama said is that Ruth and uh, Nino, which was his nickname, or Anthony Scalia, would, even though they're bitter political enemies, you know, when it came to law, they're able to set aside their differences for a few hours on a regular basis to go to the opera together. Um, so if they were real enemies, I would not want to be hanging out you know, with somebody whom I completely disagree with. But they not only you know would go to the opera, you know, they go out to dinner and things like that, and they they would converge and chit chat and you know, things like that. So and by the way, opera is a Jesuit invention. That's another conversation altogether. Um, so she was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I know she died was it back in twenty twenty or whatever it was. They so they replaced her with um, who's that girl? Amy Coney Barrett, the devout Roman Catholic. Yeah, she's part of the Jesuit secret society, People of Praise. And, okay, uh, I found out her dad actually was a Jesuit, like was a, was ordained to be a Jesuit priest. He went through uh-huh. the novitiate. Okay, so uh, and he yeah, was, I like, cover that in this article right here. Well, I believe he got his degree. Her dad, Michael Barron, or whatever his name, got at least one of his degrees from Loyola uh, New Orleans. Yeah, Michael Coney. Yep, and he he ended up a uh, law degree, and he ended up being a top attorney at Royal Dutch Shell. Ah, okay. So, gee, so, but if you look at, it's not just U.S. courts. This is Australian courts. This is Canadian courts. This is British courts. This is all throughout Europe. They run it all. Um, but as I said, we'll have to do this again soon, Eric. Oh, no, definitely, George. Like, I, had, I had lots of fun. We should definitely do this again soon. Yeah, yeah so I'll talk to you soon, brother. And, uh, of course, I've been sharing your videos as much as I can. I I hope you don't mind. <laughs> oh, no, I, no, I love that. No, no, thank you. It helps get the message out there. appreciate you doing that. Yeah, and for all you guys that are watching, uh, you never have to ask me to, to share one of my videos. I share lots of other videos, too. It's, we're all you know, in an information space here, so it's just about getting as much good information out as possible. Okay, so, so that's the I think that's the first step in getting out of the mess that we collectively as humanity are in right now. First, we just have to inform ourselves. Okay, okay. Quick question for you. I, you did a, recently a video with Nick, um, and you said um, Nick uh, posited that uh, Antony Fauci is some type of Nigel Balta. Do, do you have a source for that? Yeah, actually, we we ended up actually we had to retract that. Nick actually found that those books were a reference. Like it was uh, it was the Oxford. English dictionary. Fauci had like the collected set of like 15 books and the and the cross on the Oxford books from a distance looked like the Maltese cross, but we found a close up of that book and determined it wasn't uh nice okay. of a book. So yeah, we've I've taken that little excerpt down uh from the stream and Nick issued a correction on the Jesuit World Order blog. I'm sure Fauci is you know, a night of Malta. Just, we we don't have the doc, the authentic documentation yet. Okay, it's well, not like it's know. not like with the article I just showed recently of the U.S. Navy Admiral uh, Fitzgerald announcing that uh, that he like, it, it actually. Let me. I'll, I'll show you here. Just going back up to the screen share. I'm, I'm sure it's out there because and you know, like the Juan Manuel Barroso, is an educated former ambassador of the year. Commission now the current uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs. He also was seen in a photo like this. Like here's the photo of Mark Admiral Fitzgerald. Like that's clearly the Maltese cross from the Knights of Malta there. So if Fauci, if Fauci has, I'm sure there is a photo of there of Fauci like this, but they're probably keeping it well hidden. Well, of course, if you think about it, it you know, we we call Fauci the medical um, Jig Hoover. And uh, Hoover was a knight of Malta. But if you think about how many people, how many deaths has Anthony Fauci been responsible for for the last 50 plus years? At least millions, if not tens of millions, with his AZT. Uh, And 
just that. And of course, with how, how many other hoaxes and false flags has he been involved with? Ebola, uh, bird flu, swine flu. Um, uh, you know, probably one of the biggest examples here in the United States was a swine flu uh, epidemic, so-called outbreak in 1976. I'm sure he he had to have a hand in that. Uh, I don't have because he was at the NH, uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, so yeah, they usually reward those, give those accolades to people who serve the machine in entertainment, in politics, in the military, whatever. And of course, Fauci is a medical or was a medical inquisitor. Pure and simple. Absolutely. Just like Admiral Mark Fitzgerald was a, uh, a naval inquisitor. Uh, he actually, he led the first <laughs> Navy strike on Baghdad during the Operation Desert Storm. Absolutely. No, the, 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 this is a, this is all, this is definitely a grand, it's, it's an inquisition for sure, no doubt. You know, and Fauci predictably was the very first speaker at the Vatican Health Conference that took place in 2021. Fauci, the introductory speaker, or the lead speaker. <laughs> of course, ah. it's the Italian slickster fraud, Anthony Fauci. <laughs> well, what, what did um, Harry Mollis call him? He said he basically, Teddy Fauci is basically a stank oil salesman in a white lab coat. Absolutely, and you know, this was, and actually, we should bring this up before you sign off, George. You, right before we went live, you tied in that Kerry Mullis, and again, he was the founder of the PCR test, a, a very vocal critic of Jesuit Tony Fauci. He, he died on August seventh, two thousand nineteen, an anniversary date of the reinstatement of the Jesuits in eighteen fourteen, after their Correct. brief period of suppression, August seventh, eighteen fourteen. And then you have Kerry Mullis die August 7th, 2019. It, which, this is strange. To me, which to me, that gives credence to the fact that he, he was murdered. Well, and of course, he was a... Well, like your mic went out there, but George. Uh, I'm sorry. So Mullis was only 74 when he died. Although, from what I understand, from all accounts, he was a... A nutritionist, he took care of himself. Um, so it seems highly unlikely that he died at the relatively young age of 74 from pneumonia. Um, now, granted, his causes could have been natural, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not buying that for one second. <laughs> Think about how much tougher it would have been for the Jesuits to execute this pandemic if you had the founder of the PCR test vocally de denouncing. The use of his test in the mass COVID testing apparatus, and the the, the company that had been a monopoly on the COVID nineteen PCR test kits, Abbott Labs, its CEO was Jesuit trained. Uh, his name is last name Ford. So, Tom uh, Ford. Not Tom Ford. What was the guy's? Uh, he went to Jesuit Robert Ford. Oh right. Robert oh Ford. okay. And think of the name Abbott Labs. It's like an Abbott, like a bit like an Abbott in the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> you see, Robert. Here's his wiki page. Robert Ford. He's this guy was the CEO of the company that had a little monopoly on the CV19 test kits. He went to Jesuit Boston College. <laughs> so it's interesting how that uh, worked out for the Jesuits. Hmm. Yes. So we'll we'll have to pick this up soon because. <laughs> Because I probably should got up there about ten minutes ago. So I'll talk to you soon, Eric. It is it is wonderful hanging out with you for a couple hours. Oh, you likewise, George. It's great seeing you. I'm looking forward to doing oh. this again. Okay, I'll talk to you soon, brother. Hey, okay, talk to you soon, brother. See you soon. And just before we sign off here, guys, is I want to read this quote. I know I showed this article earlier, earlier in the stream. I want to read this quote from the Russian Orthodox leader Vladimir Vasilik, who said that the Ukrainian crusade is a catholic conspiracy <laughs> um and again this is a conspiracy here with the breakdown and the schism of the orthodox church with the cia and the vatican creating the new 
Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which has been the first step in sowing division within uh, the Orthodox hierarchy ranks there to then long term have the church be amalgamated into the Roman Catholic Church, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Um, and, you, and you see here recently the the new priest from this new this Vatican schismatic sect, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, have publicly come out and praised Nazis. Here's an article here from Ortho Christian. Ukrainian schismatic, quote, priest, unitates, which are Catholics, uh, consi- uh, Eastern Catholic priests, considered Nazi SS Gallica fighters saints. <laughs> so there you go. This is par for the course. Uh, in a disgusting yet tragically unsurprising speech, it recently came to light that another priest of the schismatic Orthodox Church of Ukraine glorifies Nazis. <laughs> Here on July 28, 2019, Vasily Sagan, a priest of the a priest of the schismatic OCU, which is recognized only by the ecumen- ecumenical patriarch, recently declared that he is certain that many members of the Nazi SS Gallica division who fought with Adolf Hitler in World War II are among the saints. You see here, this OCU priest uh, served together with members of the Greek, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Would you look at that? As the SS fighters were given full military honors. So I'll, I'll link this in the description. Very revealing story. Uh, and you see, here, this is what this ties into what the Orthodox deacon Vladimir Vlasic said here. Uh, he says. The, Catholic Church has been conspiring against Russia and Orthodoxy since the 16th century. Think about just the Ustashi Croatia, the mass murder of 800,000 Orthodox individuals in the Balkans by the hands of the Vatican and the Nazis during World War II. Um, and you have to think, too, of the, the Ukrainian neo-Nazi kind of ideological, and Stefan Bandera, uh, he's been now honored in the Ukrainian parliament post-CIA Maidan coup in 2014. Stefan Don Bandera, came, his parents were Catholic priests. <laughs> um, and this is from a government website here. Uh, IPN.gov.pl. See here, Bandera was born on January 1909 in the village of Starny Yerniv in the Kalush region in what was then Eastern Gallica. He was the son of the local Greek Catholic parish priest, Andrea Andre Bandera. And his wife, Miroslava, was the daughter of a Greek Catholic priest. <laughs> this is the, the, the neo-Nazi kind of ideological um, <clears throat> prophet of Ukraine now, Stefan Bondera. He's worshipped by regiments like the Azov Bat- Battalion, C-14, and the Rice Sector, various neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine. And, of course, Bondera is a Roman Catholic. He really comes from, uh, he's the son of a Catholic priest, <laughs> which is fascinating. <clears throat> You see here, Pope Francis, according to Vlasic, is the main beneficiary of what is currently happening in Ukraine because the war situation is giving the Ukrainian government the pretext to suppress the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarch. That's the key. So the the suppression of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is the Moscow branch, which is being suppressed. And then it'll be then merged with the branch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the new schismatic church, which I just mentioned, that being the OCU. That is in communion with the Patriarch of Constantinople. And this is the quote here from Vlasic, the Russian Orthodox Bishop. He says, there are long-term plans for the unification of the Patriarchy of Constantinople and the Roman Catholic Church. The year is already known, 2025, the year of the anniversary of the first ecumenical council, which Catholic heretics and Greek traitors to Orthodoxy are going to celebrate in such a perverted way. And they decided to choose Ukraine as a testing ground for such an alliance. The idea is simple, the creation of a single national church of Ukraine. First, schismatic groups are driven into the so-called OCU. And we're saying that's the new CIA-created Nazi-admiring Orthodox Church in Ukraine, uh, which is in communion with Constantinople. And then the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarch is attached to it, not willingly, but by hook or by crook. And then this is connected with the Uninates, which are Catholics. Thus, a single Ukrainian church of the Eastern Rite is being created. Pope Francis Vasilik says is a monster, quote, a crocodile, who, when he eats his prey, sheds tears incessantly, but eats nonetheless, 
In the same way, the Pope of Rome can weep, lament, and mourn. However, this will not stop him from eating the Orthodox. His work is such, more precisely, his nature is such. He is not the Pope, not a father, but he is a thief, a real thief, and the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> uh, Russian Orthodox priest Vasilik says, quoting John 10.10. 10. Uh, and this this priest here, like this Russian Orthodox priest, and he says here this article, like he's been quoted and or he's had his work published in quote respected Western journals. <clears throat> oh, did I? Uh, I think I accidentally exited out of the tab there. Give me a second. I just want to read the end of this quote, and then I'll probably sign off here, guys, because we've been going for a couple of hours. Uh -uh. he says that there's, there's a vlasic views like like the this is like he views this as an existential threat to orthodoxy he says either we will win vlasics for claims or we will disappear as a country and a people or even physically disappear physically in this case we only have one choice win or die you cannot fight and trade at the same time however for some reason these uh, these elementary truths did not sound convincing to some of our commanders. I wish then to sound the alarm for them and tell them that in 2023, Russia will be renewed, cleanse of its sins, abortion, corruption, embezzlement, in the presence of atheists and cultists, and finally, obscenity, obscenity and then finally, Russia will become holy Russia. That's just very interesting that you have this top Russian Orthodox leader. Isn't that, you know, I, this is exactly, I think, what is happening. This is the conspiracy of converting Russia to the Catholic Church, uh, the vision of Fatima, which I mentioned, which took place in 1917, the vision of Mary that appeared to those nuns in Portugal. Uh, and this is what Aver Manhattan kind of wrote, uh, he, uh, he sums it up well here in his book, Catholic Imperialism and World Freedom. Um, see, the Catholic Church has erected her tremendously benignant long-range policy upon this, her liberation scheme for Eastern Europe and Soviet Russia when translated into political parlance means nothing less than its implementation. This is but one of her many concurrent policies that be heard the Catholic Church. Her ultimate objective will be abstained by the implementation of the following interdependent Catholic schemes. The erection of a vast conglomeration of Catholic dictatorships through Central Europe where the Catholic Church will rule unchallenged. <laughs> That, that's already been accomplished. We see here too, this, this second part hasn't been accomplished yet. And this goes back to the vision of Fatima. The fulfillment of the promise of Fatima, Avro Manhattan writes, the conversion to the Catholic Church of a defeated Russia. So now we're in this phase of the conflict. And you see here three, the final emergence of the Catholic Church as the supreme religious political arbiter of the West and probably of the whole world after the atomic destruction of the two mightiest rivals for global dom dominion, the USA and Soviet Russia following a third world war. So this Avro was writing this back in the fifties, but I think that's th those words have aged well, but yeah, I think that's all for this one. YouTube. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. And, uh, Oh, actually my, my screen wasn't shared there at the end. This is, this is the article again I was reading out of here, was speaking, showing the Russian Orthodox leader making his comments about the Catholic conspiracy in Ukraine. Here's this article, and this was Aver Manhattan's book here, Catholic Imperialism and World Freedom, which I recommend everyone check out. Yeah, I think that's all for this one, YouTube. Nice to be back. Uh, I'll be back on another stream again sometime soon. And... Uh, it's nice seeing all you guys. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Take care.